Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our fifth annual uh, crisis conference that the IU partners with Wellspan um, to put on for educators. I just want to go over a few logistical things before we get started. Um, because we are in a webinar mode through Zoom, you cannot unmute yourself and you will not be able to see video of yourself. Also, the chat is disabled um, for all participants. So you can send a message to the, um, to the panelists through the chat, but the chat won't show up to all participants. To ask a question, just use the Q&A button and our wonderful Kelly Kyle is going to monitor the Q&A section of the webinar. And if you have a question for the presenter, um, she will ask that at the end. And if you have a question just in general about logistics or anything like that, feel free to put that in the Q&A and uh, we'll answer that either for the group or privately. Okay, so before we get started, I just want to introduce um, the members of our committee, and that way if you have any questions or concerns, you can uh, contact any of them. My name is Laura Sharp. I'm the Supervisor of Pupil Personnel Services, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, Adele Campbell is here with us. She's our Associate Supervisor of Pupil Personnel Services. And then we have uh, four wonderful people from Wellspan with us too. So Mar Margan Hoffman is here. Laura Ryder is here, Ashley Beaverson, and Betsy Hoffmaster. Okay, so that's about all for logistics. Usually we talk about where the bathrooms are and what time lunch is gonna be and that kind of stuff. But um, COVID has taken care of all of that for us. So even though we're not together, I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy that all of you can be here. And we'll start our, we'll start our webinar for today. So first off is uh, Dr. Kendra Trail. She's the Assistant Executive Director to the IU. And we are very happy to have her here with us this morning and very happy to have her with here at the IU. She's new to us. So Kendra. Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to the School Crisis Management Building Resilience During Challenging Times Virtual Conference Event. John Maxwell says, resilience is being able to come back from a setback. You're always getting back up when you get knocked down. Mary Holloway states, resilience is knowing that you're the only one that has the power and the responsibility to pick yourself up. I know these past several months have been overwhelmingly challenging, but I know you're gonna hear about some great strategies on building resilience for students, staff, and yourselves this morning. Sometimes our jobs seem like they can overtake our lives and we just give and give and give. And then we find our lives out of balance. I can't stress enough the importance of taking care of yourselves so that you can ultimately help others. I hope you have a wonderful and fulfilling morning. And at this time, I would like to introduce our first guest speaker. Dr. Melanie Callender is the Assistant Superintendent for the Warwick School District. Melanie has been at Warwick School District for the past 19 years. She has advocated for students throughout her career and has served as a teacher, education consultant, principal, and director of elementary education. Melanie earned her bachelor's degree from Edinburgh University in elementary and special education. She received her master's degree from Shippensburg University and is a certified reading specialist. She attended Penn State to earn her principal and special education supervisor certifications. Melanie completed her doctorate through Immaculata University and researched resiliency factors of kindergarten students. Melanie resides with her husband and two children in Lidditz. Welcome Dr. Callender. Great to be with you today. Uh, just give me a moment, everyone, as I get myself settled in here and uh, share my presentation. I will try my best to do two things at once, which I have discovered recently has been a challenge for me. For whatever reason, it's, it's more challenging in these times to be able to um, perhaps focus in areas and uh, talk to people at the same time, maybe because our skills are less refined. But I think we're almost here where I wanted to go, which is nice. Okay, so great to be with you. And I am just thrilled that Dr. Sharp asked me to return to uh, the IU to speak about resilience. It is a passion area for me and an area that I am hoping to share uh, both from my experiences and from our district experiences. 
Uh, however, typically I do this presentation with a co-host, uh, Bill Z, and I'm really missing my partner with uh, these uh, sessions. Bill is an attorney, a uh, local attorney. He actually serves as Warwick's uh, special education solicitor, and he himself has um, experienced trauma and is also um, has experience as a, a classroom teacher. So when you hear Bill speak about his own experiences, this experiences he had as a teacher, as well as um, in the legal world, he can really um, make some connections. So I'm sad that he's not here with us. I did keep his information at the end of the presentation in case anyone wants to reach out uh, with specific questions to Bill, as I know he would want to remain a resource to anyone who is um, participating today. So great to be here. Thank you, Dr. Sharp. Thank you, uh, Lincoln IU, for including me. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is exciting for me to talk about because it's not COVID. <laughs> so I don't know if you're like me, but I just really want to talk about anything but COVID. Um, so a shout out to everyone in education for doing everything that you're doing right now in the state of affairs that we're all living in. Not only are we dealing with our own uh, stress and sometimes trauma, in these uncertain times, but we are also trying to shelter and support other people. And that really adds to the weight of our work. Uh, I believe that uh, all educators get into the business because they wanna advocate for, for, for st students and children. I don't think that's any different today, but it does certainly make our jobs very different um, and the perspective of what we're doing very different. I was talking to a friend the other day and I said, you know, I think with COVID, what has changed for me is that I'm not as excited by what I'm doing because my days are filled with contact tracing and talking about medicine and talking about um, our partners in the medical world and, and the changes to procedure and how many people are allowed to be in a room. These are the things that I'm talking about and they're not necessarily my passion areas of how do we teach and how do we grow and how do we help support students to become their best. So if you're feeling a little exhausted these days, I just wanna put a little caveat out there. I hear you, I feel you and we will get through this. We will be stronger in the end. Um, I believe it's a natural feeling to have. So great to be with you. Um, if you if you joined me at the last presentation at Lincoln IU, I know some of the leadership team may have been there. I just want to say um, some of the presentation is going to be similar. You've seen some of the slides. Um, I apologize for that and don't apologize for that at the same time. When Dr. Sharp and I were speaking, she said, I think that's exactly what they need to hear again. Perhaps with the new lens of what we're dealing with today, it can maybe um, hit on a chord that's a little bit different than what you heard in the past. Uh, again, my information will be at the end. I did have some activities that I wanted to do uh, throughout the, the um, presentation. I'm going to modify those slightly, so just bear with me. Um, so if I ask you to do a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, or if I ask you to do a thumbs up, thumbs down instead of a yes, no, we'll, we'll try to make this as interactive as possible just to get a flair for how people are doing and feeling. Uh, so my name is Melanie. Uh, as mentioned before, I am the assistant superintendent here at Warwick School District. Warwick is located in Lancaster County, so we're, we're your neighbors. Uh, it is a small district about 40 square miles, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. We faced our share of challenges over the last, I would say, five to seven years. And because of those challenges, we have reshaped how we think about our work here at Warwick. And I feel like it is going hand in hand with some of the initiatives that the state has, that our nation has, and um, may have actually saved us some work even within the times of COVID. So I'm hopeful that sharing some of these key pieces might be helpful to you as you're facing some of these challenges now. Uh, I'll be hitting on our journey and our resilience initiatives. We try to focus on resilience rather than trauma, but we will be talking about both today. Um, trauma, ACEs, and mental health. If you haven't heard of ACEs, that's adverse childhood experiences. There's a ton of research and reading out there on ACEs, and I would encourage any educator who is not familiar to familiarize yourself with ACEs because I believe it can describe and, and perhaps put some purpose to the work that you're doing right now in classrooms uh, across our area. And then I wanna talk a little bit more about the trauma-informed approach and how we foster resilience, both as a school community and as a larger community, and what I feel the school's, school's role is in that. Lastly, that little application in red, I have a few slides indicated as application because they will have things in them that you can take straight from the slide and perhaps put into practice or ask good questions of your leadership uh, to, to make sure that you understand what the philosophy is of your district and or help shape the philosophy of your district, which would be our, our goal and purpose. 
So be looking for those red application slides. So this is embarrassing. <laughs> I don't think anything was happening the day that my mother cut my bangs, but apparently I was not sitting still for that. Uh, but this is a picture of me from kindergarten. Uh, so a little bit about me. Of course, I'm a daughter, a sister. I have nine siblings. Some of those siblings are step or half siblings. Um, I am a mother now of two children, which adds to my perspective. Of course, I'm a wife, um, a friend to other people. I'm always a teacher. I feel like that is still my role as assistant superintendent. It just looks different in what I'm teaching and who I'm teaching, but it is my passion and will always be who I call myself whenever people ask me, you know, the dentist, when they say, what do you do on your gargling? I teach her, <laughs> you know, because I feel like that is exactly what I'll do forever. Um, a colleague and an assistant superintendent. But what's not listed here is that I'm also a person who had a few adverse childhood experiences. My A score is a six. And um, those experiences have shaped me for life. The way I see the world, um, my, my body makeup, uh, the way my health is, is all impacted by some of those early experiences. I am fortunate. I had two parents who, who loved me dearly and still love me, um, but I was caught in the, in the fire of a, a, a bitter divorce and um, some substance abuse issues that went through time. And so I can tell you that as a, as a child who experienced some of those factors early in my life, um, for sure, it shapes everything that I do even today. My work and my focus in talking to you today is shaped by some of those experiences. Um, again, though, I will emphasize that I was lucky because I did have uh, strong relationships that, that were stable throughout that time. The other thing that I feel is different about my experience than some of the students that we see is that I also found school to be my safe place. I admired teachers. I can tell you every teacher I had kindergarten through my senior year by name and probably draw you a picture if I was a good artist. Uh, I could I could show you who they were because I felt like I made connections with my teachers and that's what drove me. When I had a teacher that wasn't as, as uh, uh, warm um, in the environment that they had, they still shaped me and taught me, but certainly it was the teachers who reached out. And as early as first grade, when my parents were divorcing, I remember Mrs. Reger would keep me in from recess and have me do extra work for her, not academic work, but I would pass out papers and put things on desks. She had heard about my family's divorce. I grew up in a small town. And so she heard about this divorce and she knew that I was going to need a little extra TLC. And man, it helped me. It helped me realize that school can be a positive place. But I also wanna share that not every person has those experiences with school and that we have to be really careful in our perspective about how we view students, families, and behaviors especially. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, well, when I think about Warwick, what I wanna share most importantly is that we are a strong community. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see behind me, but I'm gonna scoot across. And this uh, poster that I have here, ooh, it's hard to do backwards. Um, it says community on it and it's C-O-M-M -M, and the O-M-M -M is in small letters and then unity is all in large letters. That was actually a poster that was made after some tragic events here at Warwick that our community made to try to say, hey, we're gonna stand together and be united. But school, being a community, um, can't, be, can't be fostered if we're not building that community and being really purposeful in our work. And it's hard, y'all. We have so much going on. We have kids to think about, academics to worry about, standards, testing, um, legal issues. I hear you. And now COVID on top of it all. You know, where do I find the time to build my community? I'm hopeful to be able to share a few nuggets of, of things that I think are easy enough to put into place and that will allow to reap some benefits. I also want to share with you that each community is different. And so what you put in place at your community has to be customized for the people um, that you're serving and that you want to collaborate with, um, as well as what supports are available. We recognize not all communities have what Warwick has available to us. And so you may, you may be looking in a, in a different way to try to support those, those children. So Warwick is located in Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Back in 2013, we were voted in some magazine, 
as uh, America's coolest small town. And we have clung to that <laughs> and held on to that for a long time. But I want to share that we're also where Wilbur Chocolate Factory is. So if you've ever done some touring locally, just know there's chocolate here. So if you don't come for any other reason, come for that. There's also pretzels. Um, the Moravians settled this community. It has a strong uh, Christian faith to it. We have a large church population here and a ministerium that supports our school district. But that does add to some of the, the pieces and supports that we have. Um, it's a great place to visit. And, and more recently, we've had um, some buildup of companies that also are in the entertainment industry. So at any given time, Beyonce, Tim McGraw, you just never know who might show up in Lidditz. Um, and it has just become uh, customary to see people like that around town. Uh, right now, the uh, entertainment industry is closed because of COVID. So they're, they're struggling and some of our families are struggling because of that, because they work in that, in that area. We have 3,900 students, 320 staff members. Our population is actually decreasing, which is a really unique um, situation because our housing industry is on fire, meaning that a house rarely sits on the market for more than two to three days here in Warwick and in, in Lidditz area. Um, and oftentimes offers are above asking price. However, it's very rarely small, um, or I should say young families that are moving in. Rather, it tends to be the second or third home people are buying. And so we have discovered that oftentimes the people who are moving here do not have young children. Some of our area is um, made up of uh, adult care homes. And so we have nursing homes and uh, retirement homes in our area and a lot of 55 plus neighborhoods. So that's shaping how we um, think about our community and who we're trying to reach to try to share initiatives and, and, and gather supports. For example, in the 55 plus community, I do meet with them once a year just to chat about what supports and services we may need. And they donate to us quite regularly. They sew little bags with tooth, toothbrushes and toothpaste in them so that we can give them out. We really engage the people who are here. Because of that, we also offer adult education programming, which is often a loss of income to our district because we offer it for discounted rates to our senior citizens. But again, we feel like it's an, an opportunity for us to teach them a little bit about technology. We offer even knitting classes and um, some exercise classes to try to keep them healthy, but trying to keep our school as a safe and engaging place for even people who do not have children in them has been important to us throughout, the, throughout time. We do have stable district leadership. Our superintendent has been here over 10 years, which in our county is quite rare. <laughs> um, it doesn't seem like 10 years is a long time, but in superintendents, that's like dog years, you know, <laughs> they've been around for a very long time. And so we're really thankful for that because she has been able to shape some of the, the direction that Warwick has taken and of course is committed to social and emotional learning resilience initiatives and putting children first, which has shaped how Warwick has programmed through the years. So I, I, I talked a little bit about our tragic events. If I can just share a little bit about this. Um, we had in the last seven years, we had three student suicides and we also had uh, a tragic event. A car accident happened just feet off of our campus, right in front of our high school two years ago in 2018, almost to the day it was Monday was our second year anniversary. And in that accident, we lost two students um, and are still grieving that loss. Our district administrators, school nurses, school psychologists were the first responders to that accident. So as I sit here and speak to you, um, I'm thinking about that day and what I did um, during that time, because we were on the scene prior to police or ambulance, et cetera. And we worked as best we could, but we were not trained in that area. So you can imagine that it was pretty traumatic for all of the staff members who were on site. In addition, and throughout, that happened on a Friday afternoon, throughout that weekend, we lost one of the students um, several days later. And throughout that weekend, many of us stayed at the hospital beside those families certainly was not any expectation of Warwick staff members to respond as first responders, nor was it an expectation of Warwick School District for our staff or administrators to sit with that family as they endured the worst situation a family can face. However, at Warwick, we would have had it no other way. And I don't know that there was one ingredient or 
step that perhaps led us to that kind of response. But I can tell you that some of the work that we did with trauma and resilience in years prior to the accident did help us with the recovery of that situation. And although none of us can take that away or erase that from our, our hearts and minds as we do our work here, I do believe that some of the programming that we put in place and some of the initiatives that we had have helped our staff and district move forward. Uh, one of the things that we were um, doing early on, shortly after our first suicide, about seven years ago, as we began to update some of our crisis manuals, we found that some of the procedures were a little outdated. It is now customary for us to make those updates annually, as I'm sure many districts do. We also began to create flight team resources. And if you're not sure what flight team is, I'll just explain it quickly. Our IU here in Lancaster, Lebanon County pulls together school counselors, school psychologists, and home and school visitors to be able to respond. Maybe it's a handful, five or six from each district. That, that group then serves on the team that would respond to a district who might need supports. Because we had a, a student suicide and we called for supports, people from other districts came to us. It's voluntary. Those, those members are trained to be on the flight team and of course have expertise. Um, but they can decide the day of whether or not they're available to leave their district and report to, in our instance, Warwick School District to help support us. But by using the flight team, we realized we needed to have some resources set up. So we needed procedures and maps and things, and we needed to make sure that we had those already prepared because it was too much for a principal who's in charge of all of that in the midst of a crisis situation to be building it as they're trying to create a grief response for students and staff. So we started to pull those things together. We also have, even though our district leadership is pretty stable, we had also had in the last seven years, some changes in our building administrators. So because we had new building administrators and some of them uh, brand new to leadership, young in their leadership careers, they had a different perspective about how to serve students. Very hands-on, very uh, committed is the word that I would use. And it shaped how we were responding, perhaps in a routine manner in the past, to more of a customized personal manner um, as we moved forward. We also hired a school police officer. We had a chief of police and we still do. Um, he's a retired um, investigator from our local police department and his philosophy on uh, working with the community and with students matched ours and we're super thankful to have that police officer here. By the way, he was one of the first responders in that accident as well and really shaped how we were able to come together and do anything that was helpful that day. Uh, we have a culture of care. Uh, in my student services group, when I meet with them annually uh, in September, I have a list of things that I go over with them. And number one on my list is that I put in writing and I tell them verbally, you are a student advocate first. That is your role. And so whether it's my student services team or whether it is my gen ed team or my administrators, when we are having difficult or challenging situations, or an, a great example is recently I was uh, informed that I have a legal situation on my hands. As I started to dissect what was going on, I realized we lost connection with the family. So I followed up with the building administrator and teacher and said, Here, here's where our connection was lost and, and what we need to make sure we don't do again. We can't isolate people. We are their advocate. They didn't feel that way in this particular situation. So making sure that I even bring that up um, in challenging times to make sure that people know that that is an area that we expect people um, to do. It is one of our core foundations here at Warwick. We also began to look at mental health indicators and strengthening what our community knew and how they could support us with our district initiatives. So just a quick application here. Is your school ready? If they called you right now from this presentation and said, we need you back at district, here's our situation, a tragedy has happened, and we need to pull together the flight team. Do you have what you need? Now, I understand that not every uh, uh, student support team member may be responsible for this, but this is great information for even teachers to be aware of, of things that should be gathered and ready should there be a crisis. So here's just a list of, of things, and, and let's just talk about lunch passes, right? Because who's going to think of that in the middle of a situation? But if you're inviting a flight team in, if you're thinking about how you need to care for people and they're doing such great work for you, 
perhaps providing a free lunch to them would be a good idea on the day that they're, they're supporting your, your school and staff. So just something as simple as that to think through and create. Our school principals each summer update their crisis manuals, their bell schedules, um, their uh, building maps. And so as they're doing that, one of the checklist items that they do is they just create an emergency folder. So it's updated and ready each summer. Certainly there may need to be some tweaks the day of should we have to execute and use that, um, but at least they have the framework already built. Okay, so at Warwick, what did we do? Where, where were we heading? The first thing that we decided to do was to offer some professional trainings in the area of resilience. About this time is when we started hearing very clearly from, from teachers that they were feeling burnout and overwhelmed and stressed. And it is a common theme. I still hear the word stressed. Everybody is stressed. And I agree, I think they are stressed. Education is really a, a challenging role. And it's one of those that even when I was a classroom teacher 20 years ago, it never ended. There was never a day that I left and thought, oh, I'm all done. <laughs> that, that never happens. It's not like insurance sales where you finish your calls for the day. Instead, it's, it's constant. It, you're, whether you're at a yard sale and you see something that you wanna buy because this student loves books about this, it's, it's just always on your mind. It's who you are and what shapes you. But we began to hear from our staff that they were feeling overwhelmed and, and stressed and more so than what we had heard in the past. So we started talking about their resilience, their self-care. We pulled together some committees. Our resilience committee has been longstanding. And what we decided to do was to offer a resource night for our community. And you may think, why did you start there? I, I don't have an answer for you. That was a conversation that the committee came up with, but I'm so thankful we started there. In 2017, we had our first community night called Resilience. And the poster is right underneath uh, the, or on this slide. Uh, Resilience is a film. And if you have not seen this documentary, it talks a little bit about the biology of stress and the impact on the human body. And um, a lot about the ACEs. If you're not familiar with ACEs, this is a great film to watch. So we, we asked the filmmaker to have a trial um, of the film to show to our committee and some key stakeholders. And we invited parents, business um, uh, leaders in our community, our senator that's local. Um, and, and we pulled them all together into our middle school auditorium and said, hey, we're thinking about having a community night. We wanna show this film, it's one hour long. Please watch it and give us your feedback. The reason we did that is because as every uh, school administrator may know, it, regardless of what initiative you're trying to roll out, at times you have feedback of things you never thought of. And sometimes it's negative and we can really perseverate on that negative feedback. We wanted to know where were the danger zones to this. And unbelievably that whole stakeholder group said, this is incredible, do, do the film, show the film. So uh, we did have the, the resilience night. For the first time in my planning, we had over 500 people attend. Usually my parent nights get about 25 and I'm really excited about that. So when we had a packed house, I knew we had hit a common element for people. Um, and it took the whole committee working on this and, and doing the PR to get that response. But the topic, I think also was a topic that everybody was interested. What you're talking about stress, let me come see what you have to say about this because I know I've been saying I'm stressed. Maybe I could learn something here. So it seemed kind of an, uh, a topic that most people could relate to. And I think that, that helped with the success. From there, we've held one uh, each year, a, a parent night each year. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The second one was um, our suicide awareness and prevention. Again, I had mentioned we had had one suicide at that point. We had two more since then. Uh, and so we really felt it was important. And that looked a little different. We actually filmed some survivors of suicide, um, parents, siblings, et cetera, and showed their response to having a family member who had completed suicide and shared that with, with um, our community. And it was so moving and so touching. Um, and again, I believe the success of that night was the fact that it was tied to people right here in our community. So making it purposeful to what Warwick was facing, what we were hearing and where we wanted to go from there. Okay, so everyone knows about Maslow. I don't have to spend a whole lot of time here, but I like to remind people 
Um, I also like to give them a shout out. When people ask, who would you want to meet? You know, what famous person? These are the kind of famous people I want to meet. <laughs> I want his signature. <laughs> I would stand in line to get it. Um, you know, I feel as though um, we need to be reminded at times, what, what are the basics here? So everything I'm going to be talking about really talks about this hierarchy and that we have to have those basic needs met before we can get to learning or fulfilling our duty as people or uh, being productive in society, whatever expectation you have. Um, I hear sometimes um, from some of my friends who were in the military, they need to be you know, good civilians. Yes, they do need to be good civilians, but they also need to have food and water and safety and connection and belonging. And so we can't get to that until we have all these things settled. And I know I have a crowd here who agrees with, with this research and study. Many of you have probably heard of social emotional learning as well. I put the, the castle resource here in this slide because I feel like this is the, the best framework I have found. And if I could just take a minute to explain why I say that. Um, social and emotional learning has grown through the past few years. Uh, Pennsylvania has supported the castle model, but they haven't come out and said it's going to be their model. Um, it's still in the early growth, um, and, but it is referenced quite a bit in some of their uh, more recent publications. The reason I like this CASEL model is because it has five areas that I think I can connect to. So those are the orange, yellow, and green, things like relationship skills, social awareness, self-awareness, self-management, et cetera. Then if you look at the circles, the next darker blue circle is about classrooms. What happens in small groups in our classrooms here at the district? So what does our curriculum look like? What does our instruction look like? How are people trained to interact with students? In the next blue circle, a little lighter, is our schools talking about school-wide practices and what we're doing in the communication that we have and how are we engaging parents. So there's that, that layer. And then finally, the layer of homes and communities. So family and community partnerships, which I've spent a little bit of time talking about and we'll spend a little bit more talking about today. All of these circles, I believe, help me kind of buy into this CASEL model because it is truly what I have seen as an educator to work. When we engage in all levels, that is when we see the power of an initiative. And it really doesn't matter if it's an academic initiative or a social and emotional in initiative, all these things need to be in place in order to make it effective. However, I think when you're talking about emotional growth, social growth, it has to be beyond just what the school is doing, just what teachers are doing in their classroom. Don't lose heart, teachers, if you're here and you say, but I'm just the dark blue circle. Yes, but you're a start. Don't give up. Even if you're on your own facing this and trying to do something great, start it in your classrooms. You will not regret it. And then you can start advocating for that to have um, impact in a larger group, both schools and in the homes and communities. But every single person working, support staff, teachers, administrators, mental health workers, have a role in making this circle successful. So how do we best prepare our students? We, we are pretty good about measuring things when we talk about academics, but how do we measure things when we, when we think about trauma? One of the things I heard pretty often in my career when I was uh, a case manager of, of IEPs really invested in some of our learners who had behavioral and academic struggles, I would want to join them with their principal because I felt like I could help perhaps um, discuss the matter without making the child feel like they're in trouble. And so they needed an advocate. I wanted to be with them. I advocated for them. The principals would sometimes say, what's wrong with you? Why do you keep doing this? <laughs> and so I used to say, I think what they're saying is what happened? What happened? Tell us what happened. Because sometimes when you get into the what happened story, man, it makes sense why this behavior occurred when you hear about all the layers that happened before. But I think as educators, we can get caught up in our days, in the stress of what's going on, in the pace of which we are doing our work, and sometimes forget to ask that question and we can miss key items, ways to intervene with a student and or family that could be so much more productive. So I put this as an application slide because even if you can get that question to get turned around that perhaps isn't turned around yet in your district, I think you'll find a huge difference for how students are responding and for how the school can intervene appropriately for students. Where do we focus? Focus on three areas, engagement, self-management, and self-efficacy. 
ultimately, we ask children a lot, what do you want to be when you grow up? But rarely do we ask, what do you need to get there, right? So think about how do we engage students, all students, even the hard ones, the ones who aren't engaged, the ones who aren't motivated. You may have 10 kids you're thinking of right now in your mind. Those 10, how do we get them engaged? What would it be in our school systems? What would, what would the, the key difference maker be if we really wanted to get them to engage and help self-manage uh, their behaviors? In our framework for our strategic initiatives, we keep coming back to some of these tenants. And I think they're important just to state because if you're gonna be creating something for your own community, which I hope you do, um, I believe these are the areas that you wanna come back to. How do students feel valued? Are they feeling safe? And do you know that for sure? What is their mindset? Do they think it's fixed or is it a growth mindset? And how can you prove that in your district? And then resilience. Are we able to support students who maybe have made mistakes or have faced some challenges and allowed them to turn it around? Or does our structure and system minimize them once they've made a mistake? Uh, and these are hard questions and questions that even Warwick is still working on. So I don't want you to think that we've met this and accomplished this goal and it's a check. No, this is something that we talk about quite a bit. Uh, and I can tell you it's very unpopular at a district or school hearing to bring up some of these questions. So my suggestion to you would be to have these proactively, these conversations about these questions. These are great items to talk to your principal about when you're in um, evaluation meetings to say, hey, how does our district think about this? If you're unsure about what your shared values are as a community, a school community, that is something to perhaps bring these questions to in comprehensive planning, et cetera. If you're an administrator, the way you can apply this is ask yourself these questions in your next crisis, whatever that may be. Hopefully not COVID. <laughs> but in your next student situation, in your next activity that you're engaging in to perhaps make change in your district, ask these questions to make sure that you really have a good feel for how your district um, thinks about students and student programming. I talked a little bit about data, so I won't stay here too long, but we recognized here at Warwick um, about seven years ago that we also needed to start collecting some data. An intriguing uh, and interesting thing was happening. In my early career as a, a student services administrator, I recognized that I might have one or two risk assessments for suicide or self-harm a year. Um, not very many, and I wasn't even in the loop I, I didn't know about those or, or hear about those other than typically people were looking for what is the procedure when we have somebody who we, we now know may be having suicidal ideation. Um, but what I found was that people were actually uh, increasing the amount of, of risk assessments they were completing. Uh, so when I heard that, when I started to discover that, I, I realized that we really do have lots of trauma happening here at our district and we needed to, to change our lens. And, and it, it created um, a purpose for me in my work that was a little bit different than some of the purpose that I had had previously. Perhaps it connected things. I think always as a teacher, I was advocating. I'm sure that many of you are doing the same thing and have awesome things happening that are tied under these um, tenets. It's about really just shaping your thinking so that you're always thinking about it. And I, and I know I have people out here who think like me, so I know you're doing it. Important to know that with trauma, there's no single profile, there's no one behavior or list of behaviors to give you. Rather, it's really about making sure that we think about each child and what each child has experienced and respecting the fact that their experience may be different than ours. Uh, and then teaching some replacement behaviors and unmodifying our environment. We know this in special education, we do this all the time. Uh, and so I believe that some of these um, overview pieces seem somewhat oh yeah, they're simple, I can do these. Important to note some of the impacts of trauma, heading from adverse childhood experiences. You know, we, we know what we see in the classrooms and what shapes our classrooms when somebody is struggling from their behaviors to perhaps parent interactions to perhaps academic deficits. Um, we can see that what we don't know because we don't typically have students with us for a lifetime 
is that oftentimes these adverse childhood experiences are minimizing their longevity, their lifespan. And so when we think about, oh, it's not that serious in education, we can deal with somebody who doesn't do well in reading. What we really should be talking about is how do we give them the skills to make sure that they can gain back some years of their life? Because once they start that trajectory, things can get very serious from a health standpoint, um, leading to early death. And the research that out there out there is pretty fascinating um, and scary when, when you get into it. So we absolutely have a greater purpose. One of the things that my team jokes with me about, uh, so I'm, I'm pretty predictable. I have certain sayings that I say quite, quite frequently. And one of them is perhaps a little bit of a, um, uh, uh, a thorn in my side is when I hear a teacher, perhaps an elementary teacher saying, we're getting you ready for middle school. No, no. Or I'll hear, you know, an eighth grade teacher talking about ninth grade saying, we're getting you ready for high school. No, We need to be getting these kids ready for life beginning in kindergarten. We teach them how to share and how to be a good classmate, not because we want them to be just good students, but because we want them to be good citizens. Many of the children that we teach, especially those who struggle, will end up as our neighbors. So we have a much greater purpose in our work. It's much bigger than just what's happening next year. It's about their life. And I think this research adds to that. Just some numbers. There are always people in crowds who want to see, give me the hard numbers. So in the United States, um, adverse childhood experience research is showing us that 38 to 55 percent of our children have had one or more of the ACE scores. And the ACE uh, questionnaire talks about things like abuse, neglect, uh, sexual abuse is included. Um, perhaps a family where uh, one of the adults has spent time in jail. So they are pretty serious um, items on that checklist. And uh, I believe that hearing that our children, almost half of them, are experiencing at least one of these um, awful childhood experiences tells us that we really need to be um, creating programs for all students because this is something that won't just benefit those who have had trauma. Strong relationships in classrooms, having social and emotional programs benefits everyone. In addition, the rate of two or more is 15 to 30 percent. That's a lot. And um, if they've had one ACE indicator, it is very likely that they've had more than one. And when you see that list, you can see why. So please take some time to, to look at the, the ACE study and, and get familiar with that if you're not. So this bear slide gets me every time. I think we can all put a student name to this picture <laughs> or maybe an administrator name to this picture, depending on where you are. Um, but we know that we deal with people and you know, when we think about life on, in, in a cycle or on a timeline, everybody has ups and downs. You know, I think about some of my colleagues here at Warwick who are amazing. And yet some years they might be dealing with a tragic death in their family or an illness, or perhaps it's a life change of their children growing up and moving out of the house. And now they're refinding purpose and, and, and they all of a sudden have time in their life. Um, I believe that we have to think about the lifespan of, of just people in general, not just our students, but just know that this may be the reaction that we see, this bear, these teeth, the, the growling is what we may see. And we can take it personally. We, we really can. I, I spend a lot of my sleepless nights thinking about people who look just like this. However, I think it is important to say that oftentimes that response is an indicator that someone is having a lot going on in their life if they're responding like that to a simple request from their employer. That's not a normal response, believe it or not. <laughs> and so I think the same thing with students. If you're asking them to pull out their book and you get a response like this, you're, you probably should take a deeper look because you may not be dealing with just what's on the surface of behaviors. There's something much deeper. So one thing to, to keep in mind is that students who experience trauma, people who experience trauma, really doesn't matter your age, oftentimes we'll have an inflated response to typical stressors. So when they have uh, something that we would see as pretty predictable happen in a classroom, but maybe unexpected, um, we have that unexpected situation happen, 
we may have an inflated response, that may be something to look into. I recognize not every student who has behaviors has trauma, but it is definitely worth asking that question and thinking in that framework first before you go forward. Also, you'll see some behaviors that we're really familiar with in, in education. So I'll just leave this slide here, but just know that sometimes it's misunderstood. Please take a deeper look for your students. The three E's of trauma, the event, the experience and the effects. What I wanted to share with this is that you could have siblings from the same family and I can speak to my, my own. I have uh, three biological sisters and of the three of us, the way we have responded to the situations that have happened in our life are completely different. All are amazing people and, and successful in their own right. But it is, it is interesting when I get together with my sisters and hear their perspectives of things. So keep that in mind with families. You may have you know, siblings in a family, one student's really struggling, the others may not be. It's okay that one student may have an experience from the same situation that is different than their siblings. So just, just keep in mind, and we wanna honor the experience, not judge it. So just honor that it was an experience so that we can move forward and try to help and support. That's really what we're after. Other variables, severity, support system. I mentioned that I had stable adults in my life the whole time, which I know made a difference. We know that's the number one indicator. And so my work still requires me to think about that in my programming here. I wanted to mention that we did some mental health screening and started to take a look at risk assessments. I had mentioned to you about the increase that we had seen. Um, so I started to have a process in place where all risk assessments came to me. And when I started the inventory at the end of that first year, we had over 90 risk assessments in a year. I thought we were having two. So I was really out of touch with what was happening in my district. So if you are not collecting risk assessments or if you do not have a structured system for reviewing students who have suicidal thoughts or self-harming thoughts, perhaps they're cutting, but maybe not suicidal, those are indicators of a much greater mental health need. It may be wise for you to take a look at how your process is working, who they report those um, incidents to, and finding one person to make sure that you have them coming to. For, for our district at Warwick, it is me. I collect that data and monitor it. We also started looking at our, our attendance. We started looking at our homebound instruction and the students who weren't with us and what was that looking like because often they were the students who were in treatment facilities. And then we engaged with Teen Hope, which does their own screeners for uh, mental health uh, indicators. And we have them come into seventh grade and 10th grade to do an outside review. The negative to that is that I don't get those scores automatically. Instead, they go straight to parents and students and they, they, the parent and student, get an opportunity to say, yes, I wanna share this with the district or no, I don't. So we have had to kind of back up a little bit out of it, but we still feel like it, there are some positives in identifying students who may have mental health, um, who don't want the school to know, but are interested in treatment outside of the school. The last thing that I'll say about Teen Hope is that when we discovered uh, this program and started working with it, the students who they caught were very different than the students that we were seeing. So I just want to put out there, um, here at Warwick, we started seeing students who excelled at music and were star football players and had academic um, successes that it's just lists of things that they had already achieved. They were the ones that we caught in the Teen Hope screener. And as you may know, they wouldn't want the school necessarily to know about the struggles that they were having. So it is worth taking a look at some sort of outside screener if you haven't considered that. Again, review with your community, with your uh, school board before enacting anything, but it may be worth it. We've also increased our, our social worker this year. We, we went from one to two social workers, which we're happy about because they play a key role in some of our risk assessments as well. Overall, our, our uh, risk assessments have reduced 20%, and we believe that that is due to some of the work that we have done with social and emotional learning, K to 12, as well as more of an awareness for our staff to try to sit down and get to know kids a little bit better. We actually say to them, our, assist, our, our superintendent and myself go around at the start of the year, and we say to all of our teachers, take the time you need to build the community, because we feel like we will gain back the time for instruction later if they do not know their students and they cannot um, support them in a whole child uh, format, we know that the academic struggles will continue. This year, that was vital to, to our reopening. 
Warwick reopened five days a week beginning in September. And I can tell you that our teachers needed to hear that several times. They didn't believe it on the first time. So if you are a leader, give your people opportunity to get to know their students. They need to know that's important to you too. Um, I already mentioned about the, the screener that we do, so I'm gonna skip over that. Uh, we, we have uh, had our staff engage in the ACE survey. One interesting fact, um, we, what we had discovered was at our elementary level, I hope this isn't too odd, but at our elementary level, our teachers were really supportive of these initiatives. Certainly we had, we had questions, we had concerns, where do we fit it in? How do we do it? What supports should we have? What resources are you gonna provide for us? Um, but at our secondary level, there was a little bit of a pushback that this wasn't my role. I'm here to do the academic piece. Uh, I think that's a pretty common phenomenon. So I'm just gonna put that out there, but perhaps it's not your situation. So what we thought we needed to do was, how do you get people to understand? You make it personal. So we gave them an optional ACES survey. We gave them the actual questionnaire and said, hey, fill this out. And if you're willing, we wanted everybody to fill it out, but if you're willing, turn it back into us. So we didn't require them to turn it back in, but of those who turned it back in, which I think we had about 75% returned, we had less than 8% of our staff who had more than one ACE score. Wow. So of the data that we collected, what we, what we realized is they couldn't relate. They did not have experiences in childhood that were negative. Um, and I found that to be almost like eye-opening. Wow, no wonder it was a struggle for this teacher to understand why this student couldn't get their homework done, even though they're taking care of their siblings and they have a side job. And no wonder they had a hard time understanding it. They had never experienced that. And so give your people an opportunity to, to, to be heard, to, to honor their own experiences because it's different than ours, mine, perhaps yours. Um, and most especially it might be different than their students. So let them, let them be proud of what they have, especially when they haven't had those ACE scores, good for them. But that means that we may have to do a little bit more work to explain why it's so important to respond appropriately. So get to know that. The other thing is secondary trauma is real. We, we recognize that before the trauma and, and um, incidents tragedy that we had here at Warwick, we now see that even more so. So as we were going through the trauma, we could see how the weight of this, even people who never had the two students who were involved in the accident, having an awareness that our district had lost two of its students weighed down most of our staff. And so being aware that trauma exists and secondary trauma is important and real is important. And, and that's kind of what I wanna kind of spend my last few few minutes on because I recognize that I, I, I can probably talk about a lot of this for a long time. I wanna talk about your staff. And um, if you are a teacher, maybe you'll be saying yes. Um, if you're not and you're a leader, uh, I hope that this kind of, um, pulls at you a little bit to say, hey, what have I done recently to try to help my staff? More so now than ever, it is important that we have an understanding of what teachers are, are dealing with and what our administrators are dealing with. And so you can't talk about one without talking about the other. Um, to me, we're educators in this together, but it is important to know that many of our educators have tender hearts and they bleed for their students. Remember how I said this work never ends. We're always thinking about it. I don't think it's any different than when I was a classroom teacher and had one of my students who I knew had a rough home life and I worried all the time about that student. What's different for me now is that I have about 40 that I know by name, I know exactly where their home is and I worry about those students all the time. And so I don't think that it's different for administrators versus a teacher but I do think it is important to recognize the weight of it. And as a district put in place some procedures to make sure that teachers are aware that you know, and that they are as equally important to you as the students that they're caring for. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about trauma sensitive school. Here's a nice little graph to talk about things. Um, as I'm mentioning now, I'm over in building staff capacities because I think that's the one thing that can be forgotten in our initiatives is how do we make sure that our staff is equipped and feels supported on a personal level. 
I added this resource if you have not seen the trauma-informed approach plan from PDE. The model board policy that is coming out now requires that districts um, create a trauma-informed approach for their district, and many are already working on a plan. We have not finalized our plan at Warwick. We are still building it, um, but they have great resources in this document. So if you haven't seen this, please Google the Crime Commission or the Commission on Crime and Delinquency Model Trauma-Informed Approach Plan Guidelines for School Entities, a great resource. So I'm just gonna skip ahead here just a little bit. <clears throat> okay, relationships. So know that um, if we don't take our time to focus on staff and make sure that they feel valued, there's no way for them to give that to students. So I believe that districts who really understand trauma and resilience think about people first. It does not mean that you pick staff over students. Okay, I get this question a lot as a, as a district level administrator. Oh, you're doing this to punish the staff or you're doing this just to take away from the students. There's always this us versus them mentality that we try to, to avoid and debunk. This is about everyone. We have to talk about relationships at times. An initiative will, will create more work for teachers at times. And at times, an initiative may create more work for students. Um, I believe what's important to think about though is the spirit behind, why are we doing this? Talking about what is important to do within the initiative and how do we keep our relationships strong? So whose voice haven't we heard? How can we engage teachers at an early level in an initiative to make sure we have their voice and how to keep things efficient? Or what can we stop doing? Do we ever ask that? I, we often ask about what more can we do? What can we stop doing? You know, um, And so there are some things that we can stop doing as districts and it's important to have that conversation when we're talking about um, building trauma-informed approaches. Self-care, and this is an application slide. I just wanna say, when you're dealing with, with staff, know that we have high rates of burnout in education. We have high rates of stress. I believe our teachers want to be here to make a difference for students. And I believe that they would get behind the tenets of any trauma-informed approach or plan. However, I do believe we need their voice in what works best for them. Here at Warwick, we started working on a social, emotional, and academic development. We call it SEED learning program. I was not involved at all other than to give time and provide the place. One of our building administrators sat each time with the team to meet and our teachers created the curriculum. And in the work, they created it so that it is packaged and easy to manage, but it is 10 minutes every day at the start of the day for students to open to a warm entry into their classroom. And there are key tenets that are within that 10 minutes that talk about a welcoming activity, engaging in some purposeful um, reaction and then making sure that there's closure to it. But it really is a check-in, not anything different than what we've been doing in education for years and years, but we've structured it so that people don't struggle with it and teachers created it so they really like it. And we're so thankful for that because this year we were able to start our day as we returned from COVID with 10 minutes of social, emotional and academic development each day, K to six. We're still working on what that looks like seven through 12, but we have increased the amount of small groups that we're doing with our counselors and our school psychologists. Um, and we're also taking the time in professional development to talk about how teachers are doing. Um, Self-care is so important. And, and we, as an administration here, walk around and we ask, how are you? And we don't wanna hear the canned answer, I'm fine. No, 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 how are you? How's your family? How's your kids? How's work going? What's the stressor? We ask more questions because we really wanna hear it. So an example from this year um, is that we recognized people were even more stressed than what we had heard about in the past and, and near tears with us in conversation. Our uh, superintendent and myself, we visit every building every week talking to, to teachers in and out of classrooms. And what we realized is that we needed to add an ACT 80 day uh, to our calendar and have teachers work remotely for a day. And so we've put that, just had it board approved it will be um, November uh, 30th, I think it is. The day after Thanksgiving break, we added another day into our calendar to give teachers a break, give our administrators a break. Um, 
and we're hoping um, that we are able to do some things like, how are you building your self-care plan? And they can submit it early so that they don't have to necessarily work on that day, but we need them to give us more uh, back about how they're taking care of themselves, especially in these times. This is also our first year of using the flexible instructional day, the FID day. I don't know if any of you are familiar. Um, so we are using that time for, for teachers to prep for that day as well, so that we meet the PDE guidelines of what an ACT 80 day means, but we're able to actually enter a break. You know, it's really hard to be creative in education because there are so many boundaries, but I just wanna give hope that there are, there are possibilities and our answer may not work in all districts, but it is important for you to consider how we can support our teachers and make them feel heard about what is happening in this day and age. Uh, I'm gonna skip through a couple of these pieces. I had talked about our resilience and the factor. So a couple of things about resilience I think is important because this is what I like to focus on rather than just trauma informed, but what do we want students to be? We want them to be resilient. What do we want adults to be? Resilient. And so what do they have? What are they? And what can they do? And talking about that in, t in, in terms of students, when you have a student who's struggling, certainly not in the moment of the struggle, but one of the post struggle um, interview questions that we have for students is, tell me what you plan to do. What, what are you really good at? What can you do? Who are you? What, what would you define yourself as? We try to get to the heart of who they are to pick out those pieces and give them more purpose and reason to try to recover. And I think, I think we all need that break. Um, and in these times, our adults need that same break. They may come in screaming and a shouting over something that's going on. Um, and we can diffuse that by saying, tell me what, tell me what you want to have done because sometimes we have the same mission and we don't even know it. Know that resilience is kind of a journey. You don't just get there whenever you start talking about it. So if you start on um, the initiative of trauma-informed or resilience activities, just please be aware that, it, that it's not an overnight piece. And it's something that perhaps you work with a student all year long and you know, teachers, you work all year long and you may not see the benefit at all. I recently had a student who was, uh, a student that I taught at the high school who reached out to me via social media and um, connected to tell me how um, his early 20s were a struggle, but now he's getting his life back on track. And he wanted to thank me for something that I had told him way back when, and I didn't even know that I told him this, um, but it was, it was some affirmation that I had provided to him and that had stuck with him forever. And so um, just know that you, you can impact it one day at a time, even when you're not seeing those gains immediately what you say matters and, and should be measured carefully. There are different types of resilience as well. And Christian Moore wrote a great book. He's a, an author from Maryland, I believe, um, about the different types of resilience that one may have and, and that sometimes they're in conflict with one another. For instance, if I have street resilience and I come to school and use my street resilience, that may not be welcomed. So be careful as you're, as you're uh, talking to students, especially if they have to be, streetwise, that you don't remove a key factor for them to survive um, outside of the school as you're building school appropriate resilience. So just know that and keep that in the back of your mind, depending on your environment, that's a key piece as well. I think uh, recently grit has started to be a bigger conversation when we talk about resilience and, and motivation in grit was, I just listened to a podcast on motivation in grit. Um, and how in order to have true grit, one, a student or an adult also needs to have motivation for that, which makes sense. How can you be gritty about something and push through if you're not even willing to do that? Um, and how important it is for us as, as teachers not to reinforce motivation necessarily, but to foster motivation. And so what we say and how we say it really matters. And I know that teachers spend a lot of time rewording their feedback to students to make sure that they're fostering that motivation internally. Oh, that's a lot of information. I think I, I wanna boil it down to say first, thank you for your work. What you're doing right now in these trying times is nothing short of heroic. And our students, your students need you. Um, as you ride to work each day, I want you to focus on that, that you're needed and your um, value may not be, be, be measured ever, ever, <laughs> but that every single day matters and that you are the key piece to that. 
I also want to say, make sure that you're taking care of yourself and you're finding ways to advocate not only for your students, but also for your, your staff and your community to make sure that they are informed and can support you as well. And then I know I need to leave, leave a little time for, for comments. Um, so I'll do that now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Callender, that was wonderful. If you have any questions or comments for Dr. Callender, please put them in the Q&A section of, um, of the Zoom link. And I'll just mention while we're waiting for any questions or concerns, Dr. Callender mentioned grit. We are um, in the PPS department here. We're doing a book study. We have a little book club every year. So we choose a book every year. So this year we chose Angela Duckworth's um, book just entitled Grit. And there are some wonderful resources out there for um, grit for teenagers and grit for younger children as well. So um, we're really enjoying kind of going through some of that. Um, grit is very similar to resiliency. So some of those resiliency building strategies, not only for our staff, but also for the students that we serve. Yes. I do want to mention that um, Nadine Burke Harris has a great book about the ACEs. She's done um, TED Talks. Um, now she is the um, health department secretary in the state of California, I believe. Um, but she has done an awesome job. She's a medical doctor who found this um, research on ACEs to be so valuable to her work as a, as a pediatrician. So she wrote The Deepest Well. And so if you haven't read this book, I would highly suggest it. It gives you some background and it's a quick read. It's an easy read. Um, and then I already mentioned the um, Commission on, on Crime and Delinquency, their uh, report about trauma. It's full of resources and blue lined links that you can click right on and get to if you're looking for more supports from a PA lens. Great. Well, I'm not seeing any questions, Melanie, just a lot of accolades about what a wonderful presentation it was. And if we were here together, we'd give you a great big <laughs> round of applause. Um, oh, it was you. just a wonderful presentation. It was compassionate and informative at the same time. So we really appreciate your time this morning. And um, I know how busy everyone is. So we appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule to be with us this morning. You so if there are any questions, just kind of, um, oh, Hold on a second. We do have one question. So Ron's asked if you run into pushback. I know you mentioned a little bit of pushback from your high school staff. Um, do you have any suggestions on how you combated that pushback? Yes. <laughs> so I would be um, untruthful if I told you that I didn't have pushback even today. Even today we deal with that. And, and um, I, I do recognize as a leader that, you know, I'm looking for full commitment and always hundred percent, but if I get 80, I'm doing okay. <laughs> and so I do as a leader have to separate, you know, what is um, uh, something that, that can be accomplished versus what is my dream? What do I want to have happen? Um, but the way I deal with people is pretty stable. So I always want to meet with people to talk about what their concerns are. Perhaps there's something I haven't thought about. And I I do not pretend to be the expert at anything. I'm, I'm a learner too. And so I approach uh, staff feedback, even the negative feedback in that light. Tell me more. Why are you concerned about this? Uh, and what I have recognized is that I've had to do training on how to talk to parents and um, what does uh, communication look like in a digital age? And um, how can I set up my, my classroom so that I can have time to do some small group discussion and get to know you exercises and do my academics. And those conversations I'll take any time. Let's, let's talk about it because I need, I need information from them in order to give feedback. So getting them to open up and talk. And, and, that's, and that's what I would say. I would say that most of the feedback that is negative comes out of a spot of either fear or the unknown. So an expectation that they have set for themselves that maybe isn't my expectation and talking that through or perhaps alleviating their burden to say, I hear you. And yes, that is so important and I need to get to that, but that will never work unless you do this first. And let me explain why. So just kind of working beside them. Um, and the, the other thing is, I, I don't think we're doing our jobs if we're not hitting a little bit of that. I, I don't think we're changing systems and making things better for our communities if we aren't hitting resistance, whether it's with the community, the school board, 
the administration or the staff. It comes in various ways, but that is the work that we do. That is our commitment as leaders. And so I feel like that is that is part of this of this um, role that I have. It doesn't usually set me back long, <laughs> um, but I but I do still have resistance. Wonderful. So that was our last question. So again, thank you, Dr. Callender, uh, for your time and your expertise this morning. It's 9.15 right now. We're going to take a break in our conference and rejoin each other at 9.30. And, and um, it's just one more reason that I'm sad that uh, we're in um, we're in a virtual setting because Dr. Jansen and I have went to uh, university together and got our doctorates together um, in the probably more than 20 years. I hate to admit that, Kathy, but in the more than 20 years that I've known Kathy, she's very passionate about um, crisis and stress management and um, a positive crisis, a positive response to crisis situations. So um, Dr. Jansen has been a psychologist with Wellspan Philhaven since 2003, um, but she also serves as the clinical director of South Central PA Critical Incident Stress Management Team, uh, which is a lovely resource uh, for us to access here in education. And maybe at another time, she can talk a little bit about that and how we could kind of partner with them with some of our crisis responses and things like that. She's taught psychological first aid and critical incident stress management courses for over 20 years. So um, it's with my great pleasure that I um, turn things over to Dr. Kathy Jansen. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you very much. So let's make sure I can do this uh, screen share, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was the part I was most concerned about, making sure that worked. So good morning, everybody. Um, so as, as Dr. Sharp kindly said, I, I've been working in the field of psychological first aid and crisis response for a very long time. Um, and a bulk of my work has been with first responders, police, fire, EMS folks. And, and we do that work through a program called Critical Incident Stress Management. One component of that is assisting individuals in crisis, and we use psychological first aid to do that. And so psychological first aid is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a first aid intervention. It's an evidence-based first aid intervention that anybody can learn how to do. So my hope today is to have you understand um, what it is and when you might use it and just the very basics of how you might use it. Obviously, in order to feel comfortable um, using for, uh, first aid skills, you would probably need a, a much more in-depth um, conversation than what we're gonna have time for today. So there's, um, there's usually six to eight hour classes on how to provide psychological first aid. Um, some of those are have been available online even pre-COVID. Um, the Veterans Administration has some good stuff online for free if you wanna get some more training. Um, or in post-COVID world, hopefully there will be some opportunities for live trainings in how to provide psychological first aid. Um, but just as, as Dr. Callender had shared, when they had their incident and people in the building ran out and became first responders to a situation that, that they didn't really have the training to respond to, we all have basic first aid knowledge and basic first aid skill that we can use until more professional help gets there, more trained help gets there. And so I think of psychological first aid as, as very similar to that physical first aid. So we're not teaching anybody in basic first aid classes to do surgery or to diagnose uh, conditions in people. We're teaching how to help until other help can get there, until more trained help can get there. Um, so we think of psychological first aid as similar to that. It is evidence-based. It comes in un unpackaged in different um, titles, um, but basic psychological first aid is, is pretty similar across um, places that you can learn the skills. Our goal in psychological first aid is to reduce initial distress that's caused by an unexpected event. 
what is a traumatic event will vary greatly from person to person. And it depends on the event itself to some degree, but it also depends on your previous experience, where you're at in your life, how you're feeling that particular day. Um, that something that, that might on one day just be a difficult or distressing moment could become particularly traumatic based on other factors that are going on with the individual. So one of the important things to know about psychological first aid is that everybody who's impacted by an event will experience a very broad range of responses from kind of that resilience, this is difficult, but we can do this. So not particularly traumatized by the event to becoming extremely traumatized by the event. Um, when, when we respond with psychological first aid, we're typically responding to a number of people who have been impacted by an event. However, psychological first aid can also be used for an individual situation where there's just one person who's impacted by the event. It's really important to know that psychological first aid is not therapy. Um, it doesn't have to be done by therapists. Um, I, I kind of jokingly say it's actually easier to teach non-therapists to do psychological first aid than it is to teach therapists because we're, we're kind of trained to want to go deeper. Um, in therapy, we're trying to evoke change. We're trying to evoke some sort of change that's going to help the individual's life be um, more effective for them, for, for them to be more adaptive to their environment. In psychological first aid, we're not trying to evoke any kind of change. We're trying to help restore the individual to their pre-crisis level of functioning. So therapists kind of struggle with that idea if the pre-crisis level of functioning wasn't particularly effective for the individual or was causing some problems for the individual. We don't deal with that in psychological first aid. One of the things that we can do and that, that we stress with people who are providing psychological first aid is connecting that person to the next level of resources once we're finished speaking with them. And that can be a variety of different resources. But if, if we're helping that person get back to their pre-crisis level of functioning, and there's some indication that that wasn't a good level of functioning for them, then we have an opportunity to help them find that direction. So what we're trying to do is basically connect, connect with people who are in a crisis state, um, help them make a plan for immediate safety, immediate coping, and help basically calm them down. Now, having said that, we don't ever tell someone to calm down. Um, telling someone to calm down has, I, I don't think ever in the history of the world, calmed anybody down, um, but we're helping them to find that place. We're partnering with them, kind of walking along with them in that journey to find that place of, reorienting to the world and calming down. There's one model of psychological first aid that uses the, the, the phrase look, listen, and link. Um, and I, I like the simplicity of that. Um, following a, um, a distressing or potentially distressing event, look around and see who's doing well and who's not doing well. Look for people that need the most immediate intervention. Um, and then we listen and we connect people with resources if they need additional resources. So that's probably the sim most simplistic description of psychological first aid that you'll ever hear. Um, so I'm gonna get into some of these things more specifically um, as we um, talk about the, the process of doing psychological first aid. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I wanted to provide this information for you to um, kind of look at afterwards. Um, so interestingly that uh, Dr. Callender shared a picture of a bear, um, must be the, the theme for today is fighting the bear. So there's lots of information and you've probably seen lots of information about the human stress response, but it's important to think about in context of psychological first aid and in context of why that's helpful and why not providing it could create problems um, in any setting, but particularly in a school setting. So we have our um, emergency response system, our onboard emergency response system that helps us survive in the immediacy of what we perceive to be a crisis. A, a threat, a, a, a sense of crisis can come from two basic places. It can come from, and, and what we're going to spend most of the time today talking about um, is an external source. Something happens in the environment around me um, that my brain perceives as a threat and kicks on this, this um, survival mechanism. Crisis can also come from internal events, however. Um, so I, I start thinking about 
um, you know, something that's going on in my life and it triggers a, an internal response. And those situations can be harder to recognize because there's not an event to define it. Um, but um, psychological first aid can also be helpful in, in those situations. However, as I said, today we're gonna focus on external events that create the, um, the opportunity to provide psychological first aid. <clears throat> so that alarm system, that fight, flight, or freeze, is um, predisposed within us, whether you're going to, under the perception of immediate threat of harm, you're already um, kind of hardwired to either fight back, to run away, or to freeze. Um, that's, that's something that's part of our DNA, literally. Um, if you've had the misfortune to have experienced what you believed at the time to be a, a, a threatening event, um, you probably already know whether your go-to is to fight back or to run away or to freeze. Um, I happen to be a freezer. I've, I've noticed that in, um, in some situations that I've been in. And we can't change the fact that that's how we're wired. You can, through specific types of training, um, change that wiring. So if you think about um, people who um, train to be in armed forces, for example, you can come into, uh, into the uh, armed services with any one of these reactions and the training that they provide will teach you to respond differently than you're hardwired to respond. But it takes a lot of training. So that, that is a malleable process with the right kind of training, but it, it works like this. So you're kind of going through your day and something happens and your brain goes, this isn't okay and you start scanning the environment for what is the threat and what do I need to do? And at the, the moment that your brain and your body recognize the threat, um, you're going to start responding in a way that um, you, you best hope um, is going to help you survive this event. So that's that alarm stage. One of the things that um, research has shown us is, vast majority of people will at some point in their life be exposed to a distressing critical incident, to something. Um, and most of those people recover and they recover just fine um, and they go on with their life. And it, it may be an unpleasant memory, but their, their life goes on. Some number of folks though will be distressed for a longer period of time and their life will go on, but maybe not quite as effectively as it had prior to the event. And some people will develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So when we're talking about helping people following a crisis, it's important to know that not everybody needs our help, um, that most people have some form of, of resilience or coping um, that they're going to use to get through the event. And we can, we can enhance that. We definitely don't want to interfere with it or to get in their way. Um, and a very small part of, of people will, will have a, a lasting impact from the event. And here's where that starts. Here's where that lasting impact starts. When that alarm phase goes off, the, the body, and I'm oversimplifying this, so if there's any neuropsychologists out there, I, I uh, apologize in advance. The, the body sort of cuts the brain out of the loop for uh, lack of a, of a more scientific term. So the brain is still aware that there's a threatening situation going on, but the body kind of takes over to respond. So think about it like this. Um, I'm getting ready to cross the street. I look both ways. It looks like it's safe. I step on the street, I step onto the road and suddenly I hear a noise. I look up and there's a giant bus barreling towards me. Okay. And my body goes alarm, 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 alarm. This isn't okay. This is an unsafe situation my body will kind of say, okay, brain, we're done with you for right now because I need to run. I need to get out of the way of the bus. Hopefully I wouldn't freeze um, and probably not wise to try and fight back against a bus. So um, my brain is not completely unaware of what's going on, but my brain is kind of put on the back shelf for a minute so that my body can use all of its resources to survive this immediate situation. When that happens, the brain kind of goes into record mode. And again, this is very oversimplified where it's recording sights, sounds, smells, all of those things, but it's just following along with, the, with what the body's doing. When that immediate threat is over, those systems should come back together. 
the brain should reconnect fully with the body neurologically, and then you experience that um, that that exhaustion phase or that that letdown phase or that that post crisis phase of great relief, of great emotionality, of however your body's going to respond. And think about the importance of that. So if I see a bus coming and my brain starts to process this event and only my brain is processing the event, huh, looks dangerous, probably shouldn't stand it, this could be bad. Your brain simply takes longer to do things than your body does in the alarm phase. Um, so when I get safely to the sidewalk, hopefully, and my thinking and my reacting come back together, I'll experience this, this um, em emotional reaction. Um, and then I will at some point return to my baseline level of functioning. If that doesn't happen, if that thinking stays disconnected from the doing for an extended period of time, the likelihood of me developing PTSD at some point down the road goes up. So from the moment that alarm goes off to the moment that my, my system kind of resets um, is a significant period of time in terms of how I'm going to recover long-term. One of the things I'll hear from people um, with post-traumatic stress disorder is they'll be telling me about the event in terms of a timeline. So this was five years ago, this was two years ago, whatever. And they'll say things like, I've been living my life since then, but I feel like I'm watching myself live my life. Or I, I hug my kids because I love them and I know it's the right thing to do, but I don't feel it. I don't experience it the same way that I did prior to this event happening. Um, and those are, are kind of um, some, of the, some of the experiences, some of the indicators that the people have developed PTSD from the moment that that event happened. So here's some of the, the physiology of what's going on. If you are responding to someone or you are involved in an incident that has just concluded or very recently concluded, this is really important stuff to know because this is what you're dealing with, okay? So you're, you're dealing with um, physiologic response that's going to have behavioral consequences. And that's very important for understanding um, particularly working with children, but working with anybody in the immediate aftermath of a crisis is that they, they are essentially in some functioning ways, not the same human being that they were before you get this, um, this adrenaline dump. All of these physiologic symptoms come from that alarm trigger, that, that fight or flight response trigger that dumps epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, all, all of those get up and go chemicals into our body. And it changes the way our body functions and it um, changes the way that our brain is functioning for that period of time and for the recovery period of time. And the recovery period of time is, is pretty interesting because we, as, as human beings, we're kind of not that great at understanding what's going on in our body when we're going through experiences. So if I, if I go back to my bus example and I get to the other side of the sidewalk safely, once some of these things start calming down, once my heart rate starts to slow, once my breathing starts to slow, once my thinking starts to clear up a little bit, if you would talk to me about two hours after that event and you would say, are you back to normal? I would say, I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. It was upsetting, but I'm okay. Physiologically though, I'm not. And I probably won't be for a good two to three days. Now that how long that takes is just a, is just a, a rough estimate. And it, it, there is a correlation between the intensity of the event, how long the event took to unfold, and how long that, that process to physiologic recovery um, takes. Um, and, and it has a significant impact on our uh, mental and emotional recovery as well. Um, so if you're working with somebody who had a, a, a critical incident yesterday, you're working with somebody who is physiologically altered from the way that they were prior to that event. And there's also a cognitive response, the way that our brain makes sense of the world. And this is a very important part of that response. So if I go through a stressful event and, and what I'm saying to myself, my, my narrative about that is, wow, that was really awful. I've got support, I've got what I need. I'm uncomfortable, but I can do this. I don't wanna do this, but I can do this. I'll have a very different recovery from somebody who says, this is, this is overwhelming, I can't do this, I won't do this. Um, Sometimes when our, when our brain kind of clicks with this is a life-changing event, there's another part of our brain that says, nope, 
nope, not going to experience it. So many years ago, I worked um, with Victim Assistance Center, and we provided hospital accompaniment for sexual assault survivors. And across the board, what I would ex what I would see, and then we would follow up with them for um, however long post event they they needed um, care or support. For the most part, when I would see people in the hospital, you know, they, they've been through this horrific traumatic event and they're at the hospital and now they're getting the care that they need. And, and people would say, I survived. It was awful, but I survived. And I'm just really grateful that I survived in that moment. Um, and when we, we would talk about, you know, if you want follow-up counseling, I don't, I think I'm okay. I, I just, I, I survived and that's the most important thing because that's the focus in that moment. Two weeks later, four weeks later, four years later, however, um, people really start to realize that their life has been altered, that, that the way they think about things and the way they view the world um, has been what feels like irreparably altered. And then they're coming and saying, I'm not okay. So the way that we evaluate an event um, can change over time. And our, our human instinct is to say, I survived, it's okay. It's gonna be okay, I'm fine. Um, and it, sometimes it takes a while for us to recognize that, um, that this event has um, altered the, the way that we feel, the way that we think about things. So psychological first aid, one of the things that it can do is plant that seed of we're going to support you right in this critical moment, but also that talking with people about feeling differently about events can be helpful and having a good psychological first aid experience is predictive of people engaging in treatment um, post-event further down the road when they may start to experience difficulties, lasting difficulties relating to that. So once we go through that event, our bodies kind of go into this resistance phase um, where we're starting to repair the, the physiologic damage um, that the stress response has caused. And that the cognitive sequelae of that is that I survived and I'm okay in this moment. Um, even though it's really can be the beginning of experiencing some of the um, sort of side effects of um, the immediate impact of trauma that, that we'll be talking some more about. Um, and then we get into this exhaustion phase. And th these phases, it's important to think about when we're talking with someone, is this an isolated one-time event, like almost getting hit by a bus? Or is this something that's been unfolding over days, weeks, months. So if you think about COVID um, and talking about, which I, I know we're all trying not, not to think about these days, but um, how this is kind of the, the, the um, COVID burnout that people are starting to talk about, we're tired of it because it's a lower level threat that we've had to adapt to and adapt to and adapt to and adapt to. And that has a longer term impact on, on your body and on your mood. Um, so we would think of that as a chronic stressor. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about moving forward in, in, in this alleged post-COVID world that we're all trying to imagine and, and desperately want to get to, that we're going to be seeing a lot of mental health impacts. And it, it results from people being in this exhaustion state of, you know, I get worried about something and then it just keeps happening and keeps happening and keeps happening. The immediate aftermath of a crisis, we see reactions that fall into all of these domains and it's really important to think about what they look like and how they're impacting people. Um, I did put some, some information in here. Typically when I talk about psychological first aid, um, I don't go into specifics of if this is a child, if this is an adult. Obviously um, folks work with kids and so I, I did put some developmental information in here about what behavior particularly you may see post-crisis in different age groups, because I think that's really important. Kids express emotion through behavior um, very often. And so I think it's important to know what you're looking at if you're dealing with a child who has experienced a traumatic event. Having said that, um, I, I've responded with a, a, with a for a number of school incidents uh, over the last couple of decades um, and have done some consultation work with schools around how to prepare, how to do some of the things that, that Dr. Callender talked about pre-incident, how to, how to be ready for something if it happens in your area. And consistently what I've seen is you guys are really good at thinking about what kids are going through and what kids need and how to support kids. The, the focus that I worry about is missing is how to support 
the adults who are taking care of the kids and what to offer for those adults who are taking care of the kids. Very often, um, kids will take their, their response cues from trusted adults. And so while I, I think it's, it's necessary and important and incredibly valuable to think about how to support children um, post-traumatic event, I think it's equally valuable how to take care of yourself, how to support your colleagues, and how to make sure the adults in your school community are getting the care that they need so that we're not skipping over that part to focus because we all really care about the kids. Caring about the kids means caring about yourself, taking care of yourself, taking care of your colleagues, making sure the adults in your community are getting, um, getting as good quality care as possible so that the care to the kids can be developed in, um, in a helpful way. So important to know, and this is uh, clearly preaching to the choir, children are not small adults, um, and their, um, their vulnerability in distressing situations is, is different because they're depending on us, right? They're depending on the adults to take care of them. Um, and when adults have been harmed or the adults that they're used to having immediately with them aren't immediately available to them, um, can really alter the way that, um, that kids will move through a distressing event. Um, so I, I'm not gonna go into great detail. Um, these slides will be available for you if, if that's a, a helpful reference. Um, but I, I think the important part of this is to be aware that um, behavior is emotion and emotion is behavior in kids of all ages. So I wanna get more to um, the, what does psychological first aid look like and how do, we, uh, how do we exactly do that so that we can have time for some, hopefully some, some questions or comments. So our goals of psychological first aid creating that sense of safety in the moment. I don't remember if I still have my, uh, my Maslow slide in here. I thought that was interesting too that, that Dr. Callender included Maslow. Uh, he's getting a lot of airtime today, um, even, even though there's pretty good evidence he got his ideas from someone else, but that, that's a topic for another day. <laughs> um, but, but we have to think in terms of, of that, that um, survival scale food, clothing, and shelter, if we don't have those, if we don't know where they're coming from, it's really hard to even get people to think about safety and security, the, the kind of the next rung up. And if they don't have all of those things, um, the, the, uh, the fancier interventions aren't gonna be useful to people in that moment, which is why psychological first aid is so important. So again, if you think about that parallel to physical first aid, um, if somebody is along the side of the road with an obviously broken leg and they're bleeding, it's probably not the time that they would benefit from talking about, um, you know, smoking cessation or weight loss or getting more exercise. All of those things are important for the well-being of a physical body, but that's not something that they're going to be able to absorb in that moment or that they would find useful in that moment. Um, so that's, that's really kind of the, the, the best parallel that I can think of in terms of what we're doing with psychological first aid. We want to make sure we get somebody oriented to the present moment. Do you know where you are? Do you know what's going on? Do you have um, kind of that, that um, uh, sense of, of orientation to, to where I am and, and what the context is of this event? Um, so when a crisis starts, when our brain immediately goes, oh, something's not right, our sense of time can really be altered. For most people, that's a slowing down of time. So if um, somebody has a, a, a car accident, for example, and they call for help, um, they call 911, when you talk to them later and you say, how long did it take for the ambulance to get there? They'll say like, it took an hour. And then when you look at the call logs, it actually took like six minutes. Um, but that six minutes felt like an hour to the person who's waiting for help. And that's one of the early predictors of post-traumatic stress disorder is how soon can we get that person back into real-time orientation? Um, so we, we wanna make sure that, that we're attending to um, those, those orienting kind of things. I um, wanna validate the experiences. This is, this is difficult. This is an, an important event. Want to make sure you know who their supports are, where their supports are coming from. What do they normally do to cope? Again, it goes back to that concept of resilience. People are getting through their life. They're figuring out how to live their life. How are they doing that? Or how are they doing that before this event happened? Because that's going to be the best path back to 
um, some sense of normalization and then get them to say what their plan is for immediate coping. One of my favorite conversations with people is how are you gonna get through the next 24 hours? What, what does the next 12 hours look like for you? Um, I've done a, a number of national disaster responses with the Red Cross and that's probably one of the most important conversations that I have with people who have been impacted by a natural disaster is typically have responded to floods, um, hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, and so there's a lot to think about. There's a lot, my house is gone. Um, my insurance papers were in the house. I don't know where those things are. There's a lot competing for an individual's attention. And so to boil that down to how do you get through the next four hours? How do you get through the next 12 hours can really help them reorient and start um, re-energizing their coping skills, helping them remember how they cope. Oh, I did leave it in, um, how they can cope with things. So we've already talked about it, but. Um, so the how, how do we do this? Um, I, I think Dr. Callender did a great job talking about why we would do this and when this might be helpful. Um, so I wanna focus on the, the how skills. Listening is the vast majority of what happens in psychological first aid, paying attention to somebody's experience. We validate somebody's experience when we, when we listen to it, when we honor that experience and the retelling of it. Um, so we ask simple questions um, to see what kind of help does this person need. It is true, and, and research is pretty robust in telling us that most people cope better with a situation when they talk through it with somebody. Not true for everybody though, and we need to be aware of that. That is not how everybody processes. Most people do, and most people will benefit it, will benefit from it, even small children. Um, however, timing is everything. So while I may absolutely know that if you talk to me about this event, you will feel better, I can't know when is the right time for you to talk to me about this event. So I might be available right now, and it would be super convenient if right now was when you felt like talking about the event. Um, however, right now might not be the time. And so that's an important thing to talk to people about. Um, talking about these things usually helps people feel better, but only you can really know when's the right time to talk about that. And we can re-traumatize somebody by trying to force them to talk about something they're not ready to talk about. So I, a lot of times the best way to intervene with people or to make connection with people is this practical stuff. Get, you know, when's the last time you ate? Now, the caveat to that is we live in central Pennsylvania, right? And so our solution to everything is feed people. So if you're upset, let's eat. If you're sad, let's eat. It's good to offer food, to have that available. If you have that, that resource available, you also don't want to see the slide on physiology for somebody to eat who's telling you that they're not hungry or they don't feel like eating. So one of the impacts of that, um, that physiological response is a decrease in our digestive process. So if, that's, if somebody is still that physiologically activated and they're saying that they're not hungry and somebody insists on, on them eating, you're most likely gonna make them vomit at some point because their body simply isn't capable of digesting at that moment. Um, so I usually ask people, do you remember when the last time you ate was? Do you feel hungry at all? Um, and um, and I, I'm much more um, encouraging about hydration. Um, have you had something to drink? Can I get you something to drink? Can I help you find where there's something to drink? Um, and also, depending on the situation, if you can get somebody away from the chaos of an unfolding event, that can be really helpful as well. Um, that's not always possible. Um, but if you can, it's a, it's a good thing to do. Making sure you're not intrusive, making sure that you're calm. I should probably reword that. Making sure that you look calm. So when you're responding to a crisis, it might be distressing um, to you. Am I doing the right thing? Can I help in the right way? What's my role in all of this? Um, but it's important that you look calm. Um, and that you're patient. Patience isn't my best thing, generally speaking, um, but in a crisis situation, it's absolutely critical. So if somebody wants to talk, make time to listen. If you know that you're approaching someone and you have a time crunch of some, some importance that I, I only have 10 minutes to spend with this person, you might wanna spend that 10 minutes finding somebody for them to connect with and talk to, uh, because this isn't something that you really can put a time limit on in an effective way. Um, I remember when I responded to a, um, a tornado in um, Eastern Tennessee a couple of years ago, and there was an older gentleman who lost his son and daughter-in-law in the tornado. 
and neighbors were very worried about him. So they, they brought him to us and said like, he, he's not doing okay. And he didn't want to talk. Um, so we just kind of hung out for a while. And then he asked me if I wanted to go see their home um, where his, his son and daughter-in-law lived and, and in the realm of looking calm, but you don't have to feel calm in my head. I'm going, no, I, I don't. Um, but this, is, um, this was his invitation to me to, um, to spend time with him. And so we went to the, the place where his um, son's house had been um, and, and we sat on what was left of his son's porch for probably an hour and a half and didn't say anything. And then he started talking and he started talking about um, the fact that his son and daughter-in-law had reached out to him before the storm saying, hey, you know, make sure you get to your basement. This thing could get bad. And he didn't think to say, you don't have a basement and I do, so come here. Um, and was dealing with the guilt of that, which, which had kept him silent for days after that. He was so overwhelmed with that guilt. Um, and he talked and he talked for probably two hours. And I said almost nothing except enough to let him know I was listening or paying attention. And, um, and then he started to brighten up and he started to talk about um, unrelated things and his mood started to lighten up. And then he said, well, I gotta go. <laughs> I have other things I have to do today. Um, and, and he walked off. That's psychological first aid. And that's, again, that's not something you have to be a psychologist to do. It's something that you have to be a willing human presence um, to do. And that's pretty much it. Things that you don't wanna do. The number one concern that I get from people about psychological first aid is I don't wanna make things worse. I don't wanna mess things up. What if I say the wrong thing? Um, so I always include the, this kind of as a reassurance that if you're being a kind, caring, present human being, you're probably going to be okay. Um, but there are some things that you should avoid. Um, one of the critical ones, particularly for working with children, is not asking for details of what happened. If they want to tell you the details of what happened, that's fine. But we're not on a fact-finding mission. We're on a supportive mission. And the, the interesting thing with kids is um, they don't always tell stories in a beginning, middle, end way, particularly after crisis. So kids will tell you this part, and then they'll tell you this part, and then they'll tell you this part, and then they'll tell you this part. Um, and this is probably easy for people who are used to working with kids to sit with that, um, but it confuses me because I'm used to working with adults who tell stories in an order. And I'm like, that doesn't, it doesn't fit together. It doesn't make sense. And that's okay. It doesn't have to fit together. It doesn't have to make sense. That's their way of processing it. Um, very, very different from, I, because I, I work with a lot of police officers and they tell stories like they're testifying. So they'll be like, oh, it, at 0800, this started and then this and then this, and, it, and it's very ordered. Um, and, and if you interrupt them, um, they'll pick it back up right where they left off. Like most of us will, you know, kind of change the course of our story if we get interrupted, um, but, but, but they don't, they get back to, and then at, at 0900, um, they'll go right back to it. Very different from how a kid tells a story where it's very rambling and it's not in, in any chronological order or not necessarily in chronological order. So why does this work? It, it works through making that contact, providing that safety and comfort um, for providing that practical assistance, connecting with social supports. Um, those, I think that contact and engagement, that safety and comfort, and that connecting with social supports are the key ingredients of why this works. These are all the things that we're trying to think about when we're doing psychological first aid. Information on coping um, is very situation dependent. So it's not necessarily, we're not talking about this is the time to teach people new coping skills. This is a time to help people think through how do they normally cope in, in less distressing events or at other times when upsetting things have happened in your life. Maybe not to this extent, uh, of course, depending on the situation, but what's, what has helped you then? What kind of things do you typically do? I think is probably the most important part um, aside from that providing a, um, a calm presence for people to connect with and to help them orient. So. Again, we want to be non-intrusive. We want to be compassionate. Um, you also need to know the culture of the area that you're working in. And culture here is broadly defined. So school culture, um, it would be um, silly for me as a non-school person to walk into a school culture and say, listen to me, the expert, all of you, I'm going to tell you how to do this. 
because I can't be an expert on your culture. I don't exist in your culture. I don't live in your culture. So I can say here are important things to keep in mind. How does that fit within your culture um, is, is much more um, effective than um, trying to be able to function as a, num as a member of a culture that I don't belong to. So just a, an example, we were doing a community intervention um, after a hurricane in Florida. And um, the, the community center that we were being asked to work out of was, um, had a very heavy Cuban influence. There were a lot of, of Cuban immigrants who lived in that area. So we had this great plan um, as, a, as our response team of how we were going to um, provide this intervention. And part of our plan was to do a different intervention for adults than for children. So we were gonna separate the adults and the children. And the, when, we, when we sat down to talk to the people who invited us, the first thing they said was, no. <laughs> No, you're not going to you're not going to separate us from our kids. Um, we're just we're just not okay with that. Okay, so we had to kind of rethink how were we going to deliver what we what we needed to deliver within the the um, specifications or the expectations or the acceptability of their culture. Um, obviously, confidentiality is a critical piece of this. Safety and comfort means different things in different situations. So if you're meeting, if something happened at the, at the school on Thursday and you're meeting with a parent group the following Tuesday, safety and comfort might be where are the bathrooms, where, where are the snacks, how do you, you know, get the resources that, that you need versus if your um, school building had a roof collapse in the middle of a storm and you have chaos and injured people, safety and comfort is really different depending on the situation. So just thinking about in given this situation that we're dealing with today, what does that even look like? What do we need to be thinking about? Um, and then from the very beginning of making contact with individuals, start to think about their structure, their routine. We function better in a predictable environment. I, I always laugh when I'm, I'm working with couples and, and one will inevitably say, he's such a control freak or she's such a control freak. It, my friends, we are all control freaks to the extent, some of us this much, some of us this much, to the extent that we like order and predictability in our world. So we like to know, part of what's making COVID so hard is, is we've had so many alterations to so many of our routines and we don't know the right answer. So we like routines and we like to know what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. We think in those terms. Um, and when that's disrupted or taken away from us, we don't handle that particularly well. Um, so that's one of the important things that we're thinking about is how do we get these folks um, as close to their normal routine as possible? Um, and, and how do we address it when that is zero possible, when there is absolutely no return to any routine? I'm thinking about um, folks that I worked with in, in Hurricane Katrina, where not only the house was gone, their neighborhood was gone. Like they couldn't find their neighborhood because there was so much debris. So there is no going back to a normal routine. So how do we think about establishing a routine that's going to be effective for you in this situation? Um, and then what kind of help do they need with health-related issues or daily activities? Not that we're going to be doing those things for them, but that we can help them problem solve. How do you access resources to meet your needs? Um, and again, I have all of the specifics of if you were going to become um, very adept at doing psychological first aid, and this is just to give you an overview of some of those things. Information gathering is not the same as getting all the details about what happened. Information gathering is about what does this individual need in this present moment, and how can I either help them with that or link them to resources. I, I've worked with people post-crisis that to this day, I don't know what happened to them. They didn't talk about it. And so we talked about how they're coping. We talked about what they need. We talked about connecting them with resources. I still don't know what the, what the situation was because they didn't want to talk about it right then. Um, we, we do talk a lot in training psychological first aid about the concept of guilt and how we intervene when people are experiencing significant guilt. So I think for, for, this per, for these purposes, just to be aware um, that that can be a problematic um, experience post-crisis um, that might need or might be an indicator that I, I might need to connect this person to follow-up resources. Um, talking about practical assistance, getting them connected. It, again, we're not particularly good at assessing how we are doing in a given moment. We're kind of just go to the next thing, just go to the next thing. And particularly 
um, when, when we work in a career where our focus is often on other people's experience and how other people are doing, that tends to be more of a focus. Are the kids okay? Are other people okay? Is my family okay? Um, and so it is important to, to be able to provide some basic psychoeducation on the stress response and why it's important to take care of yourself after um, an overwhelming event and what that might look like. So for example, because of the way the body sort of um, takes the brain out of the loop for a little bit during that, that immediate response to crisis, when they come back together, when, when those, those um, systems come back together, there's a lasting impact. Again, it could be a minimal amount of time. It could be a significant amount of time that people are impacted in their, um, in their functioning. So things like having difficulty concentrating or um, easily forgetting newly learned information. So the, you know, the, the family assistance center is one block down and one block over. The person gets a block down and says, Where, where's the assistance center? I don't remember where they told me the assistance center was. Very, very common. Um, being easily irritated or kind of feeling edgy, feeling snappy um, is a very common um, experience that people have. Physiological feelings, feeling kind of nauseated, um, not feeling hungry, um, or feeling very hungry and overeating, all of those are basic stress reactions that it's helpful to kind of let people know about from the perspective of you might experience some of these things. And if you do, they're perfectly normal, they're, they're to be expected. Definitely not from a perspective of this will happen to you. You will have these experiences. Um, I've worked with a number of people who have been distressed about the fact that they weren't distressed about something that a lot of other people were distressed about. So why am I not experiencing these symptoms? So it's important to let people know um, that everybody responds differently and your response is based on a multitude of factors. Um, and so comparing yourself to how someone else is doing is really unhelpful. That's like a good general life tip, but specifically following a crisis is um, comparing the way that you're responding to the way that other people are responding is not gonna be helpful. So just having some basic understanding of common reactions um, to traumatic experiences can be really helpful. Some positive coping skills, hopefully this isn't, um, this isn't news to you um, and um, can be useful skills for you personally after you've experienced a stressful event like daily life. Those, these things can be really helpful. Some things that we want to listen for people talking about, however, we can, if somebody's talking about uh, or experiencing some of these negative coping skills uh, with under the auspices of psychological first aid, we're not gonna tell them not to do this. We're not gonna tell them that this is a bad thing to do. We're gonna ask them what else can they do? What, what other tools do you have? What do you find that's more effective for you? But these are some of the things that we are concerned about um, post-crisis that people are engaging in. Um, knowing your resources is absolutely important. So for you folks, knowing your resources within your district, within your building are really helpful, but also knowing your resources within your community. What else is available um, to help individuals um, or, or who do I go to um, to find the resources if I identify that somebody needs resources? So being kind is always um, good advice, but particularly post-crisis, um, people really respond to kindness. I, I think about it almost as an energy in the air um, that, that when people are in crisis, if you think about the example with a ceiling collapse in a, in a building where there's a lot of chaos and there's people are drawn to people who are offering kindness in those moments. So it was always interesting to me when I was responding with the Red Cross, because I'm in a completely different state. I'm in a completely different geographic location. Um, and we have these little vests to wear that say Red Cross. And, and I, I, people will approach you and say, you know, thank you for being here. Or can I talk to you? Or can you help me find? But it's interesting because I thought it was the vest that would draw people to that. But there were many times I went out in the field and forgot my vest and people would still find me and people would still approach me. And I would notice them approaching other people. And I think it's that sense of you look like someone who will listen to me. You look like someone who will care. And I would strongly encourage you to be that person, um, to, to be that person that, that people will look at and say, I feel like I can talk to you. 
Um, and I think that's the I think that's the end of the slides. Um, so th this is the other thing that I that I want to say. We talk about psychological first aid, and when we train psychological first aid, we're talking about responding to a typically a single overwhelming event that just happened. So a, a building collapse, a tornado just went through the area. We talk about it in that way, and it is very useful for them. However, I also think these skills are very useful for everyday life. So we spend uh, sometimes at least as much, if not more, time with our coworkers, at least pre-COVID we did. I'm not sure what that looks like for you these days, but we spend a lot of time with people that we work with. And so we know them really well, at least in that professional sense, if, if not having a personal relationship with them. So we are a really good resource to help one another deal with stressful events, deal with challenging events. And that might be a building collapse event, but that might be a life event. That might be a series of events that's just starting to wear somebody down. So I would, I would strongly encourage you to think about these skills in everyday life. And how do you notice when a coworker's not doing okay? When, when somebody who's usually very talkative and, and um, has a lot to say is suddenly very quiet, or you notice over time that they're, be, they're very quiet. Somebody who's usually around a lot suddenly isn't around so much or vice versa. Somebody who physically isn't in your space very much now suddenly is. Notice changes, um, notice changes over time that are, are happening um, to coworkers and be willing to talk to them about it. Be willing to say, hey, you don't seem quite yourself. Is there something going on? Do you wanna talk about it? The, the more that, I, I also noticed that Dr. Kellner had a slide about ending stigma. And the, the more that we pay attention to um, how people are doing around us and the more that we are able to express a willingness to talk about that and to let people know that we care and to let them know that we're open to talking with them about things, um, I, I think that's what's ultimately going to reduce the stigma about talking about stressful events, talking about challenges that we're experiencing in a way that can help us cope better or in a way that can help us get to the, the type of help that we might need in a particular moment. Um, I think that's really where it starts is being aware of how are we doing on a daily basis as well as engaging in those self-care skills. I like the, the, the slide that was up about ways that you can take care of yourself because I think we're falling into this trap where things like self-care and resilience are becoming buzzwords and we don't really stop to think about what does that mean? Um, so I, I just, just real quick, I'll, I'll share this and then I'll leave some time for questions. I was, I was seeing a, a patient for outpatient therapy. She had been through a traumatic event and we talked about self-care. And then when I would see her, I would ask her how her self-care was going. And about the second or third time that we did that, she would, I, I don't know, she would give me some sort of answer. I don't, I can't remember what she would say, but it would be enough that I would move on to a different topic. Um, and then like the third time this happened, I said to her, like, what are you actually doing? We're, we're, we're talking self-care, like, what are you actually doing? And she kind of laughed and she said, I wondered when you were gonna catch me. I'm like, catch you doing what? And she's like, well, I know self-care is a thing and I know it's a good thing. And I know you told me I should do it, but I don't really know what that means. I don't really know what it means I should go do. Um, and so she was kind of making up answers um, when we were talking about the self-care. So we had to really um, define for her what does that mean to do self-care? And, and I would challenge each of you to define for yourself, what does that mean um, when, when we say do self-care? Um, and un, unapologetically, what does that mean? Because I've also had patients kind of turn red and say, well, I, I did it, but you're probably not gonna think it was self-care. Um, I had a, a patient who, her husband took the kids away for the weekend and we had talked about, you know, what she might do with his time. And, um, and she got very embarrassed and she said, I cleaned out the closets in the house. I cleaned all the closets in the house. And I know that doesn't count as self-care, but that's how I wanted to spend my time. So we had to kind of talk about that, right? Why doesn't that count as self-care? Did you enjoy the experience? I enjoyed the outcome, not necessarily digging through my kids' closets and finding what gross things exist in there. Um, but I felt really accomplished. I felt really good. I felt really satisfied when it was done. That counts as self-care. So if I give you a list of tips, cleaning out your kids' closets is never going to show up on that. I'm never going to put that on a list of ways that you could take care of yourself. But for her, it was a really effective way to take care of herself. So again, don't compare your self-care to other people's self-care. 
Um, not all of us can have time for or benefit from or would enjoy an hour long bubble bath with music and candles. And I think we kind of think about those things as self care. Um, that's, that doesn't work for everybody and it's not logistically possible for everybody and that's okay. Um, so that's, that, that's hopefully your homework to take away from this is to think about for you, what is self-care and how are you going to actually fit that into your life? That's all I have. So I'm open to uh, questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Camp Jansen. If you have any questions for Kathy, just put them in the Q&A and we'll have a few moments to answer them. Well, you're so thorough, Dr. <laughs> I don't see any questions at all. So um, if, if we were in person, we'd give you a big old round of applause. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Uh, you really have so much uh, knowledge. I'm sure you probably don't even realize how much knowledge you have. It just comes so fluently about this topic. So we're very, very grateful that you were with us today and able to share your expertise. Um, we're just a few moments ahead of schedule. So we'll probably take our break now and then um, come back at 1040, if that works for everyone. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Jansen. It was wonderful to have you this morning. We'll take thank our break you. now and we'll come back at 1040. Thank you. I'm, I'm not coming back. I have a patient to see. Okay, everyone, welcome back. It's great to see everyone back again. Um, this is a little bit awkward, but our next presentation is gonna be myself and um, Dr. Del Campbell. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Laura Sharp. I am the Supervisor of Pupil Personnel Services here at the IU. Um, and I'm here with um, my, my right hand, Dr. Adele Campbell, we couldn't, we're coming up on a one year anniversary here. I think next year is our one year of anniversary. So for those of you who may know her as a school psychologist, she worked in Springboro for quite a while. Um, she's come to the IU a few days short of one year now, and she serves as our Associate Supervisor of Pupil Personnel Services, and I can't imagine my life without her again. So, um, so we will be presenting the next segment here. As always, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A, and we'll try to answer those um, as the presentation comes to a conclusion. So thank you, and welcome back. Okay, um, so I'm excited to be with everybody today and to talk to you about the brain and the neurological, neurological impact stress has on the brain and um, what we can do to negate some of that negative impact. Um, so when we're talking about our experiences and stress, we know that our experiences have a significant impact on our life. And they also have a really significant impact on our bodies, even on a cellular level. Um, so our experiences have the power to create, strengthen, and organize or reorganize our neurological connections um, and to eliminate unused neurological connections. So our neurons create increasingly complex and integrated networks. And for today's purpose, we'll be talking primarily about pieces of the limbic system, um, which are extremely important for learning, um, emotional regulation and are very much impacted by stress. So we have three kind of main players, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that's responsible for executive function. It regulates thoughts. 
emotions and actions, it's pretty vulnerable to elevated um, stress hormones. Um, and it matures later in childhood into, as we know, early adulthood, um, where we still see some of that poor decision making with our adolescent population. And then also the amygdala, um, which is the part of the brain that triggers emotional response and detects whether or not a stimulus is threatening. And elevated cortisol levels caused by stress can affect the activity of the amygdala, and it typically matures pretty early on in life. And then also the hippocampus, which we know is really important for learning um, and for short-term memory. It connects the emotions of fear with the context in which the threatening event occurred. So elevated cortisol levels, um, increased by stress can cause growth, impact the growth and performance. And typically you see the hippocampus developing pretty early on in life. Okay, let's see here. So we know not all stress is created equal. As we heard from Dr. Callender and Dr. Jansen, some stress is actually really good. There's stress that we certainly want that helps keep us healthy and alive and safe. Um, so we've got positive stress, tolerable stress, and then chronic or toxic stress. So like positive stress would be like that fight, flight, or, or freeze response where we're reacting very quickly and um, it helps keep us safe. So if you think about an example of this, I think about there was a time my husband witnessed a car accident. He got out of his car, called 911 on his cell phone while walking over to the car saw that the woman who was driving was stuck in her car, somehow managed to get her door open, asked if she was okay. She said, yes, he got back in his car and drove to work. And I was like, why didn't you stay until the ambulance arrived? And he's like, I don't know. I just did what I had to do. And then I left. Um, so that would be an example of that positive stress. So it's typically mild. We have a brief um, increase in heart rate and stress hormone levels. It helps us to be alert and prepare us for situations that require that focus and energy. And it helps to really build a healthy response system for coping with future stress. So not only is stress, some stress really important for keeping us safe and healthy, but also experiencing some levels of stress helps us develop those really good coping strategies. Um, and we know that the body's stress response is controlled by the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. That's a mouthful. Um, the HPA axis. Um, so typically what happens is during a normal stress response, you have um, an increase in cortisol levels with kind of three different hormones kind of being the main players. And typically they stay elevated until the threatening situation is gone and then kind of dissipate and you resume your baseline level of functioning in your HPA axis returns to normal. Um, but then we also have situations where we've got more chronic stress or increased stress levels. So tolerable stress, it's more serious, but still typically temporary. Um, and it can be buffered by those protective factors that we know about and that were discussed earlier this morning. It has the potential to be damaging, but typically doesn't result in long-term neurological impact. And when I think about what we're currently going through now with the pandemic, I think about this tolerable stress. We're still able to kind of go through our day-to-day -day functions, but we have this like kind of persistent level of stress that wasn't present before, or the stress that we're experiencing is novel stress, which is kind of creates its own um, level of difficulty in terms of identifying those barriers and overcoming them. Um, so we want to think a lot about tolerable stress and the impact that has and how we can decrease our stress levels right now when we're just kind of experiencing ongoing stress. And then there's the chronic stress, um, which is when we really see that neurological impact that's lasting and negative. So it's intense, frequent, or chronic activation of that stress response system. So that HPA access, those hormones that are elevated and then kind of dissipate, remain elevated. Um, which is not what we want to experience because when those hormone levels remain elevated, it actually creates a toxic environment in the brain, which is why this stress is called toxic stress, um, and then impacts some of our neurological pieces. Um, so that hippocampus, um, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. So the amygdala actually strengthens, it thickens, and the prefrontal cortex um, weakens as it does the hippocampus.
Um, it's more likely to occur, especially in the absence of protective factors, and it does have a negative psychological impact. Um, and I just want to show you real quick a video. Bear with me here while I stop my share. Then. Okay, so this is an example of what a brain would look like with neurological firing under typical circumstances. So you can see kind of the action potential, that electrical impulse moving down the axon into the soma, the body of the neuron, and then these dendrites here, which help connect to other neurons so that you can communicate. We know that um, cells that neurons that fire together, wire together. So the reason that's important is because when we're frequently in just on my share again, sorry. Okay, so when we're frequently in that elevated stress response, what happens is our body kind of acclimates to that and we reinforce that pattern of functioning. So when Dr. Callender and Dr. Jensen had mentioned earlier in the morning that sometimes a student's response to something or a peer's response to something, a very benign stimulus seems outrageous. So they're reacting very strongly to something. It might be because they've been in that chronic stress response. So now their kind of basal level of functioning is that fight, flight, or freeze. So you have that really big reaction that doesn't match with the stimulus. And the more that you're in that intense chronic stress response, the more reinforced that neurological pathway becomes. So the quicker it is to kind of get there and the harder it is to resume like a calm level. But even from a neurological standpoint, what that like baseline level looks like would be elevated compared to someone who hasn't experienced that level of chronic stress. So here are just some more pictures of some of the neurological impact. So we can see breaking of the dendrites here. And that's really important because our dendrites are what help form the connection with other cells and that neurons can communicate with each other. Um, so when you've got a breaking connection, obviously things aren't um, wiring the way they're supposed to. And then also some dendriatic shortening. And if your cortisol levels stay high for long enough and it creates a toxic environment of the brain, you can have atrophy of neurons, which so it would be neurological um, damage. And we know neuroplasticity is an amazing thing. People are naturally resilient and we're not giving you this information to be anxiety provoking, but more grounding this in science to know why it's so important to engage in those really high quality self-care strategies that are embedded in your day to day, because luckily there's activities you can do that strengthen the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex and kind of pull away from the amygdala, amygdala a little bit so that you're able to negate the impact that stress has on you neurologically, which is awesome. Um, any questions about any of this so far? Okay, so we know there's a couple really easy things that we can do just to promote our overall wellness and to help brain health. So just physical wellness, our nutrition, exercise, good sleep hygiene, um, we know that the hippocampus is able to regenerate neurons, which really not that long ago we thought wasn't possible, and that the brain can make new connections with neuroplasticity. So that nutrition, exercise, good sleep hygiene is massively important for brain health. Um, it really helps with that regeneration, the neurogenesis, neurogenesis of the hippocampus. Um, and making those good neurological connections and giving the brain the ability to engage in that neuroplasticity. The presence of caring and supportive relationships is a massive buffering factor when you're thinking about stress response and the body stress response and the lasting impact. So if you think about cortisol as the stress hormone, when you are able to turn to someone as a supportive, caring person, whether it be for a student 
you know, being a caregiver or a teacher or someone else in their lives or us as adults, you know, our family members, our peers, our friends, whoever we can kind of pull on as resources that produces oxytocin, which we know is sometimes called the love hormone and it counterbalances the impact that cortisol has on the body. Um, and you really wanna have a well-established self-care routine. So when Dr. Jansen had said like, you, we talk about self-care, but what does that actually mean? And it does look different for every person. And sometimes it is just making sure you're getting adequate sleep and nutrition and taking care of your physical wellness. Um, but then there's also things that you can embed into your day-to-day -day life that target those stress parts of the brain. So like the limbic system. So Dr. Sharp is going to review some of those with you today and talk about the positive neurological impact those activities have on the brain. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Bill. Um, so when we're looking at self-care, self-care is as unique as each one of us is. Uh, we're going to talk about just a few research-based um, stress management, resiliency building, self-care kind of strategies. And one of those that I really love, and there's a lot of research to support this, is the use of mindfulness. And I think mindfulness is another term in our society that's getting kind of uh, bantered around quite a bit and has lost some of its um, focus. But there's a lot of research out there to... Um, to, to sustain that mindfulness actually can change the neurological structure of the brain. So um, research studies have shown that as little as 10 minutes of kind of quiet, mindful activity, sometimes meditation, can uh, over a six week period, so just six weeks of, um, of 10 minutes a day can strengthen the, the frontal lobe of the brain and actually shrink the amygdala. So the amygdala, as we um, talked about, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do a, I got a little, a little signal, signal coming, coming up, up here on, on the, the um, on, on the Zoom, Zoom call that, that I didn't recognize. recognize. So um, the amygdala, as um, our three presenters have already shared, is kind of the thing that triggers that fight or flight response. And it engages the sympathetic nervous system, which is very good for our fight or flight response, um, but not so good for engaging um, other areas of the body. So our parasympathetic nervous system is kind of the counter to that. And the parasympathetic nervous system makes sure that our immune system is working well, make sure that our cardiovascular system is working well, that sort of thing. Make sure that we're thinking more clearly during these times. So being able to have a mindfulness practice helps to engage not only just the parasympathetic nervous system and kind of uh, let some of those uh, functioning within the body work as it should, but it also will, um, through neuroplasticity that Dr. Campbell just described, will actually change the structure of the brain and make us more resilient, not only on a daily basis when we um, face some of those more mundane kind of stresses, but also make us resilient if, um, if and when we face some of those bigger stressors, you know, so um, those those car accidents and floods and things, and um, and you know potential suicides in our schools. So all those big challenges that our presenters talked about throughout the morning um, are more easily kind of faced. We have a bigger kind of. Our, our resiliency muscle is stronger when we engage in some of these things. So mindfulness is, uh, has a lot of different definitions, but it's a very simple discussion of um, just paying attention on purpose in the present non-judgmentally to the unfolding experience moment by moment. So how often are we doing two or three things at one time? How often are we doing the dishes at home um, while we're watching TV or having a conversation with our spouses or something like that? Mindfulness would say that when you're doing the dishes, just to do the dishes. How often are we um, having a meal while we're driving a car or, um, or on, a, on a Zoom call, that sort of thing? Mindfulness would say that we just in that moment need to be focused on eating and that sort of thing. Um, so it's very difficult to do in our society. And I think our society is really built 
um, to, to not have some of that mindfulness. Most often um, throughout the day, I can say that I'm engaging in more than one activity at a time. And mindfulness seems like a really welcome kind of luxury when I come back to it. So paying attention on purpose to the unfolding of the present moment, non-judgmentally. I think a lot of people um, have expectations of what mindfulness should be or not be, and a lot of times are very critical of themselves. And I think this kind of bridges over into self-care sometimes too, that sometimes people's self-care um, can be kind of mean towards themselves or destructive. Their self-care may be to kind of uh, lose weight or change their diet. And they're very, very critical of themselves when their diet falls outside of whatever parameters they put in for themselves. Or their self-care is to, you know, run five miles in a day and it's very punishing towards their body. Maybe their body is not receptive to that um, form of exercise. So we want to make sure that we are practicing in a non-judgmental way that um, when it comes to mindfulness, the brain is wired to seek novelty and to seek some type of movement. So um, our brain kind of swings like a, like a monkey mind, sometimes I describe it. So, um, you know, it swings from branch to branch to branch. And then sometimes we don't realize how we've gotten there. So in this moment, I can be focused on um, being in the room that I'm in and I look at the color of the carpeting and I think to myself, oh, uh, my grandmother had carpeting that was a similar color. So my mind swings to that branch and then I start to think about my grandmother's house and how, um, how the kitchen was set up with the olive green um, refrigerator and stove. Then I think, oh, she used to really uh, make cookies for me every Sunday when we came to visit. I could really go for some cookies right now. Boy, I'm really hungry. Uh, I wonder what I'll have for lunch this afternoon. And then all of a sudden, I'm no longer in the room that I'm in with the blue carpeting. I am um, having uh, a, a mystery lunch um, this afternoon in the long term and that sort of thing. So it's very, very common for the mind to do that. And mindfulness takes time and it takes practice, um, but, and it takes patience and an acceptance that this is just the way our brains work and that some days we can be mindful and other days there's too much going on and that, um, and that we have a really difficult time focusing on mindfulness. Okay, so we have a couple of activities today that we're gonna practice. Um, but before we do that, um, I, again, I shared that the research on mindfulness is really growing, but mindfulness has been shown to benefit not only stress um, and, um, and anxiety as we talked about this morning, but chronic pain as well. And John Kabat-Zinn was the, the quote that we, um, we had for mindfulness there. And he was, um, uh, a physician up in uh, Massachusetts, and he really brought mindfulness to uh, a more research-based and medical practice. And he worked with people with chronic pain and um, then uh, cardiovascular issues, heart disease and um, diabetes and that sort of thing. And now his work has been stretched to uh, deal with all type, different types of medical issues. If we could go back to the slide. Um, but also anxiety, depression, eating disorders, drug and alcohol addiction, um, all these things that we want to um, add another layer of uh, psychological treatment for. Mindfulness can do that. Certainly the resiliency building and the emotional regulation that we've been talking about today um, is another area that's really um, benefited by mindfulness but our memory. So uh, our memory is impacted by chronic stress and you guys may be feeling that um, now, um, but um, because we are all under chronic stress with, with COVID and trying to get the schools uh, working within this pandemic that we're living in. But the hippocampus is one area that is, um, that is damaged by um, chronic stress. So I always give the example that um, 
you know, you may have a student that you're working with on a math concept and you've worked all day on that math concept, the student understands it, and then they come back to school the very next day and it's like Groundhog's Day, almost that they're starting over again. So the hippocampus is impaired um, when it comes to uh, chronic stress and the hippocampus helps us consolidate memory and move those memories from our short-term memory over to the long-term memory. Um, so you may feel like you're forget a little more forgetful or that um, things that came easy to you and the concepts that um, you were fluent with before are a little more challenging for you um, now in this uh, pandemic that we're experiencing these levels of high high uh, high stress and that sort of thing. So that could be due to the hippocampus and the mindfulness is one um, benefactor to that as well. Attention and focus, our metacognition and understanding how our brain works and how it's best for us to remember information. Our executive functioning that Dr. Campbell talked about. So all that long-term planning, breaking down bigger tasks into smaller tasks, thinking about the consequences to our actions, that sort of thing, all benefited by mindfulness. And then awareness of our body and our thoughts and our feelings and the environment around us it's often very, very common that when we are in chronic stress kind of mode, we lose track of um, where our thoughts are on a moment to moment basis. We lose track of how um, our body's been impacted by the stress that we're in. And we certainly lose track of our feelings on a regular basis. So all of those things can be enhanced through mindfulness. There's a lot of different ways to enhance mindfulness. Um, one, I love to work with, use with kids, but I use it with myself too when I'm feeling like I'm not in the present moment, that I am um, off somewhere in the past or off somewhere in the future. And we can just practice it together right now. It's a very simple concept, um, but if you just right now in this moment, focus on five things that you can see. So five things you can see in the room around you. Four things you can feel. It can be the temperature of the air, the feeling of uh, the clothing next to the skin, maybe uh, the feeling of the pressure feeling uh, against the floor, or against your hips, again, in the chair that you're in. Three things that you hear. Two things you can smell right now. And one thing you can taste. So when you focus all five senses on the present moment, it's very difficult to not be present in this present moment. Uh, certainly our minds can shift off uh, immediately when we're finished and we may re need to redo this again. But for me, it's a way that I feel a little more grounded when I feel like I'm floating out there in the future or stuck back in the past, kind of perseverating on something that's happened this morning, um, just to bring me back to the present moment. And the present moment, as we know, is the only moment that we have control over. Those things that happened in the past, we can't go back and redo them. And the things that may or may not happen in the future, we don't have ultimate control over that either. But in the present moment, we have control over what's happening in that moment. So um, we know that a feeling of control, uh, as Dr. Jansen mentioned earlier this morning, is really important um, to mitigating stress and feeling more resilient. And um, we are often out of control over what happens to us. So focusing on the present moment is a way to help us to feel a little bit more in control of things. This is an exercise that I love. I use it throughout the day, probably almost every day. Um, and it helps me feel more in the present moment, but it also um, is helpful when I'm having long days that I'm in front of the Zoom um, all day and I'm sitting in my chair. So it's a nice way to bring some movement to the body, but it's an also a nice way to engage the parasympathetic nervous system and matching movement to the breath is really a key component of mindfulness. So I encourage you all, if you're sitting to stand now and we'll move through this um, together. So stand tall, just feel the weight of the body on all four corners of the feet and focus a little bit on your alignment. And for me, this often means that I need to uh, have a little more engagement in my core. So um, make sure that your ankles are under your knees, your knees are under your hips, 
your shoulders are over top of your hips and your ears are over top of your shoulders. You may wanna tuck the chin slightly to uh, elongate the back of the neck and you're standing nice and tall. Your shoulders are relaxed, your hands are um, loose and see if there's any tension in your face. If you can relax the forehead and the jaw, maybe the tongue in your mouth and just let go of some of that tension you have in the body. And then start to focus on the breath and allow the breath to settle down for a few moments. And then on the inhale, just raise your arms overhead, fingertips in line with the shoulders. On your exhale, just drop the head back and look up towards the sky. Inhale, we're gonna bring the head back to a neutral position. So ears are over top of the shoulders. Crown of the head's reaching up towards the ceiling, just like the fingertips. And on the next exhale, we're gonna swan dive down, sweep the arms down, folding only at the waist. Allow the arms to hang heavy. The hands can rest on your shins. They can rest on your feet. They can rest on the floor, whatever's comfortable for you. And we're gonna inhale. We're gonna look forward with a nice flat back. And then on our next exhale, we're gonna fold again at the waist and see if that crown of the head wants to reach any more closely towards the floor. With our next inhale, we're gonna swan dive up, sweeping the arms overhead. Exhale, once again, looking out only towards the ceiling. So just the head drops back. Inhale, the head's gonna come back to a neutral position. So our gaze is right in front of us. And then on our next exhale, our hands are gonna to come to rest at the side. And again, we can close our eyes in this moment, focus again on our breath, feeling the energy that's been created in the body. And we'll do one more round of the sun salutation. So we're gonna inhale the arms overhead. On our exhale, look up towards the ceiling. We're gonna inhale and bring the head back to a neutral position so our gaze is in front of us. Exhale, breath will swan dive down, bringing the arms down to rest, maybe on our knees or on our shins, on our feet, on the floor. Inhale, we're gonna look out with a nice flat back in front of us. Exhale, we're gonna fold again, only at the waist, crown of the head reaching down towards the floor. And our next inhale, we're gonna swan dive up, sweeping the arms overhead. Exhale again, we're gonna look up towards the sky. Inhale, our head comes back to a neutral position. And then on our next exhale, we'll bring the arms down to rest at the sides. Again, we can close the eyes, turn the mind inward, focusing only on the breath and the energy that's been created in the body. Feeling grounded on all four corners of our feet. Wonderful. So I hope you enjoyed that. That's an exercise that I try throughout the day. Um, one when I'm not feeling very much in the present moment, when I'm not feeling very mindful, I feel like it kind of brings me back to the present moment, but also too as just a way to move the body a little bit as um, I find myself sitting so much in front of the computer these days. Uh, another thing that I like to do, um, and those of you who know me know that I am a yoga teacher, but um, I, we have a handout that we're going to share with everybody in with everything else um, that is just kind of desk yoga. So um, this, what I put together is just a series of nine um, kind of poses that you can do from your desk just to stretch some of the areas of the body that are very, um, the tensions created in as we kind of sit for long periods of time. So this is a seated pigeon pose. And this is my, uh, my lovely daughter who was the model for us for all of these poses. But if you wanna try this one, um, what I need you to do is just sit in your chair comfortably. We're gonna have a nice posture in our chair. So shoulders are over top of the hips, 
and ears are over top of the shoulders. Um, our feet are just in front of us on, uh, at a 90 degree angle. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is just take one foot uh, either your right or your left, you can start with. In yoga, we always do both feet, but place that ankle over top of the shin or the knee there. Um, and we wanna flex our foot. So we have kind of a, a figure four kind of shape here. A nice 90 degree angle with the bent um, leg. And we're gonna remain in an upright position. So you may be feeling some uh, stress relief in your, in your hip of that bent leg now. And if that's enough sensation for you, I want you just to stay right here and breathe with the sensation. I always tell people that sensation is the body's way of letting us know that change is occurring. And we really want to make space for that change to occur. So I'm feeling some um, sensation right now in my hip of that bent leg. So um, if you'd like to feel a little more sensation, so maybe you have open hips, I encourage you just to um, bring your elbows onto that bent leg and just bring the body forward. So we're like a small fold just at the hip right now. So we're stretching the torso forward over top of that bent leg and just um, paying attention to that sensation that we have here in the body. We're gonna hold um, this pose of sorts for a few more moments, usually five to 10 breaths. And then we'll bring the, the shoulders over top of the hips again. We'll allow that bent leg to rest again uh, on the floor. You might feel like you wanna shake it out a little bit and that's um, fine as well. And then we'll do the same thing on the other side. So both legs are kind of, the knees are bent at a 90 degree angle. We're gonna take the other leg, bring it on to um, the, the thigh of the other leg. And we can either stay right here or bring our forearms onto the bent leg and bring the torso a little further forward. So folding only at the waist again, just as much as brings sensation, a comfortable amount of sensation into the body. We don't ever wanna hurt ourselves or push the body so hard that we have um, kind of strong sensation, but we do wanna have some sensation here and we know that change is happening in the body. So we're strengthening these, um, muscles. We're bringing uh, fresh new blood to that area of the body that can become stagnant from sitting for long periods of time. So if this is something you're interested in, this is another thing that I would encourage you to do um, is just it brings us to the present moment, but it also allows us to kind of stretch the body a little bit and not become so stiff and sore and tired from sitting for long periods of time. Okay. This is something I wanted to share with you guys. Um, for those of you who have, who have been to the York Learning Center, you might have um, seen that we do mindful moments in the uh, restrooms here. So a lot of times um, our staff says that the bathroom is the only time that they have um, to take a few breaths and be mindful. So we have some uh, resources in our restrooms um, where we share um, some mindful moments and some suggestions for people to be mindful uh, in that present moment too. So one of my favorite um, exercises to do is to just uh, engage the parasympathetic nervous system by dropping our chin to our chest. And we can do that right now since we have really good posture from the, uh, from the desk yoga that we just did. So we just drop the chin to the chest and take three deep breaths here. So that's all that's needed to engage the parasympathetic nervous system, which kind of disrupts that chronic stress fight or flight mode that our body's in sometimes. So it's very simple, very easy to engage the parasympathetic nervous system. And there's a lot of wonderful ways to do it. I do this in my car all the time. So um, for me, I know uh, it just brings to my awareness every time I come to a red light that I wanna uh, engage my parasympathetic nervous system a little bit more to build my resiliency. So I'll drop my chin to the chest, take three deep breaths there and that sort of thing. Um, so many of you maybe don't want to drive with me anymore, but I always make sure that it's just as the light turns red. And I know that I have a few moments at that traffic light. So it's just a time that, um, that I kind of incorporate 
a tiny bit of mindfulness into my day. So mindfulness truly is a practice and it truly is something you want to integrate into different points in your life. So if there's another kind of signal for you that you can use to do some breathing exercises, it really uh, changes the structure of the brain. Uh, neuroplasticity is a wonderful thing. It can be very detrimental when we don't pay attention to neuroplasticity. But if you pay attention to how malleable the brain is and how receptive it is to uh, intervention strategies, it really can be very empowering in stressful situations and kind of fun to think about all the little caveats that we can build kind of some of these brain-based exercises into our days. Gratitude is another research-based program um, that I think um, has a lot of evidence to support it when it comes to neuroplasticity and that sort of thing. So we'll just talk about a couple different exercises um, that can be incorporated into our days. Um, so the research will tell us that gratitude strengthens relationships. It promotes forgiveness. It does a lot of wonderful things for the body, like lowering the blood pressure, reducing symptoms of illness, reducing anxiety, depression, strengthens our immune system, helps us with sleep. All these wonderful things that we want more of in our lives can be accessed through gratitude, research tells us. It increases our um, subjective view of happiness and life satisfaction. It boosts feelings of optimism, um, life satisfaction, joy, pleasure. It can uh, encourage uh, us to be focused more on our health and can increase resiliency decreasing stress, decreasing the impact of trauma, mitigating the, effect, the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder it can also cause us to be more helpful, more compassionate, and more altruistic. And the research would say that it helps us to be more compassionate towards others, but it also helps us to engage in a higher level of self-compassion, which is really, really important. So gratitude can be brought into the life in a lot of different ways. Is this my okay. Um, I think um, some examples would be just kind of keeping a gratitude journal. This is something that I've worked with for probably five or six years now, but I've just kind of restructured for myself. So I was found myself during COVID being overwhelmed by some of my work and my personal life circumstances. So I um, move my gratitude practice to the evenings. So I keep a journal next to my bed now. And um, each night before I go to sleep, I, um, I, I write down three things that I'm grateful for from the day. And it helps me to sleep at night because instead of thinking about all that needs to be done tomorrow or the difficult and challenging things that happen throughout the day before I go to sleep and then being woken up at two o'clock in the morning by my brain who says, hey, you need to start working on problem solving for some of these things that await you in the morning. Um, instead of doing that, my brain is focused on the good things the things that I'm grateful for, the people in my lives and the, the events that I've had that have been really, really helpful for me. Another thing that I do as part of that nighttime ritual is that um, I've been trying to focus on making some positive changes in my resiliency building, which, ha which have to do with my physical health. So um, I write in there to the things that I'm happy that I was able to um, change some of these small daily habits for myself um, and take better care of myself um, throughout the day. And I write a goal um, on what I'm gonna do um, for the next day to, um, to enhance that resiliency, enhance that self-care activities. And I, I've made a promise to myself that if I don't meet those goals, I'm not gonna be overly critical or judgmental of myself when I'm not doing that. I just set a goal, I try to achieve that goal. And if I fall short, um, then that's okay. Or if I suppress, suppress uh, surpass it in some type of way, then that's okay too. I try to be non-judgmental and try not to attach a lot of uh, meaning to that. Okay. Um, gratitude can be used to, to kind of write thank you notes to people, which um, certainly uh, they could be people in your lives or people that um, 
people that you don't even know that you're grateful for, some of the first uh, frontline workers and things like that right now. Um, I think when you express gratitude towards them, even if you're in the drive through and that sort of thing, expressing gratitude to the people that are working in fast food or in the grocery store, as well as those healthcare providers who are um, kind of keeping things afloat for us in our society, I think is a nice exercise for the person that's given the gratitude to someone else, but also a nice um, event for someone who has, um, is receiving that issue of gratitude too. I think gratitude can change relationships too. So if you have someone in your life that may be challenging for you to deal with, to think about things that you're grateful for about that person as a human can be helpful as well. So all of these exercises can kind of um, change the neuroplasticity of the brain um, and also um, create this form of resiliency that we're looking to have more of in our lives. And what you oftentimes see is when you're engaging in these ongoing practices, you see a thickening of the prefrontal cortex, which is that higher level thinking and your executive function and the hippocampus, um, which we know is involved with learning and memory. Um, and again, like a pulling away, less reliance on the amygdala, that emotional response. And if you do this with enough consistency, there's times because the hippocampus is taking your emotional kind of experience and tying it to a phys physiological response that, you know, at that stoplight, eventually Laura might not have to do her, um, you know, chin to chest <laughs> breathing. Her body will look at that red light as a, as a cue and kind of engage in some of that de-stress and um, kind of that neurological response automatically, which is really cool. Um, I was joking earlier that my HPA access or access had triggered and I was disconnected from my brain um, when I was presenting about the brain. Um, so when Dr. Jansen had talked about when you're in that physiological stress response with your body, your brain kind of disengages a little bit. That's what she's referring to where like you're not maybe thinking with your prefrontal cortex and really clearly you're just kind of reacting based on a physical response. So that is all we have for you today. So there's a couple. Oh, thanks. thanks. Um, I was muted because, because Laura and I are in the same, same room and I was trying to avoid an echo. Mm. We, we might be, be echoing. echoing. Um, I, I had just talked about the neurological benefit that engaging in those really good self-care strategies will thicken the prefrontal cortex you've got that good myelination. So your action potential, those neurological connections um, are very strong and rapid. And the hippocampus, which we know is very involved in memory and learning and the emotional response paired with the physiological response. Thanks for letting me know you couldn't hear me. Do we have any other questions, either about um, the presentation that we just had or anything else um, that was discussed this morning? There was one question in the chat about um, my example about the monkey mind there and um, the blue carpeting and then all of a sudden being off to lunch. Uh, if that was an example of not being mindfulness mindful or an example of mindfulness. And uh, I'm sorry that wasn't clear, but it was just an example of the brain's natural tendency to not be mindful and that mindfulness is a practice in bringing us back to the present moment. So to stay here in the room with the blue carpeting and not travel off to your grandmom's house and where you might be having lunch this afternoon um, is an example of not being mindful, but the brain naturally wants to do that. It naturally wants to follow activity and movement. So mindfulness is just a practice of continuously bringing ourselves back to the present moment. Um, so it's not a failure. Uh, it's just kind of trying to counteract the brain's natural desire for movement. I guess. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense. 
So think about how much of your day you spend thinking about something that just happened or something that's going to happen as opposed to the present moment that you're in. So it's kind of just being more present in that actual, the current moment. Okay, do we have any other questions this morning? Okay, if another question pops up in the box, we'll answer it. But if not, um, that'll conclude our um, webinar for today. We wanna thank you all for spending some time with us this morning. Um, this has been a great tradition and a great partnership between the IU and WellSpan. We're very, very grateful for it. I'm hopeful that next year we can be back in person together again, um, but we'll just have to wait and see where the pandemic leaves us. Did you mute yourself? I, I had myself. Okay. This, this is, is our, our first time, time hosting a webinar. webinar. So, so there, there was lots, lots of growing happening today. Um, thank you guys for being patient and um, attentive participants. If you have any follow-up questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to us. But um, if not, that concludes today. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Oh.